Welcome to my Golang for DevOps and Cloud Engineers course. What is Go or Golang? From the official Go homepage, go.dev, build fast, reliable, and efficient software at scale. Go is an open source programming language supported by Google. It's easy to learn and to get started with. Built in concurrency and a robust standard library. Growing ecosystem of partners, communities, and tools. Who am I? My name is Edward Viana. I am a DevOps and Cloud Specialist and Training Instructor. I started publishing on Udemy in 2015 and now have more than 250,000 students enrolled in one of my DevOps and Cloud courses. Since 2017, I have been using Go extensively as it became more popular in the DevOps and Cloud space. After years of writing Go code, I feel comfortable now to create this course and teach you all the Go tips and tricks I discovered over the years. What are the course objectives? To be able to read, understand and write Go code. To be able to write enterprise ready applications. To be able to write applications that integrate with REST APIs. And to be able to write applications that integrate with a cloud provider. To be able to write applications that integrate with Kubernetes and to be able to write applications that integrate with any custom integration that has a Go SDK available. So this last one is a natural follow-up. Once you've seen enough examples, you should be able to write Go applications using any SDK available because you should know how to do it or how to figure out. This is the course layout. We will start by understanding Go by example. I will show you the HTTP GET application. That's where we get started. It's our first application. Then we will continue with Go concepts. I will explain you the main concepts using examples. And then we're going to start integrating with SDKs, cloud providers, Kubernetes, by learning how to use external packages. So there are a lot of external packages available to integrate with external providers, like cloud providers. And I have some great examples to show you how to do that. I will write all the Go programs myself in the lectures and the demos that are coming up. And lastly, a link to all course files can be found in the next lecture. It's called the source files and useful information. Save that content somewhere and make sure that you know where my GitHub repository is because that's where all the Go source files are located that I will show you in my lectures and demos. Before we really can get started, you need to be able to edit Go files. If you already have an editor, great, you can use that one, or you can use Visual Studio Code, which I'll be using. I will show you how to download and set it up, and in the next lectures, you can just follow along. You can find Visual Studio Code by typing VS Code in any search engine, and then code.visualstudio.com should be the first one that appears. And you can download a version for Windows, Mac, or Linux. The download should start immediately. And then when you click on the download, it should stop the installer. You should accept the agreement. And then you can just install it wherever. So I'm not really changing anything. I'm just clicking next and install to have Visual Studio Code installed. Then you can launch Visual Studio Code. And then you should see a get started page. What you can do first is you can open a new folder, a new project. So we'll make a new folder. Go hello world. And then select this folder. So now I am in the go hello world folder. And let's create a new file. Our first go file to make sure we have all the extensions installed. So the first error that you will see is fail to find the Go binary. And you still need to install Go first before you can write any Go code. You can click on that link or you can go directly to the download page of Go. The official web page is Go Dev, And here you can download a version for Windows, Mac, Linux. We are Windows. We are going to download the Windows version and then we are going to run the installer. Again, next, next, 
and install. And then once it is installed, it's probably best to close Visual Studio Code. You might have to close it a few times in the beginning to make sure that once you install all the components, that those components are also correctly loaded. Finished. And then let's close this just to make sure that it's properly reloaded. Let's open it again. And then once you open it again, it's possible that you already see a pop-up coming to install the Go extension. If not, here you can type in Go and click install to install the Go extension. And then it will immediately start complaining about lots of dependencies that are not installed, which you all have to install. So go tests, go modify tags, go play DLV, go PLS. So these DLV is for debugging and go PLS is for autocomplete. So these we definitely need. And then it will all download these. And then once these are all downloaded and you see go outline, it also asks go outline. And once these are all installed, we can test our first program. So what do we need to have installed? We need to have installed Go, the Go extension, and then all these tools that Visual Studio Code will propose. We will need another restart, but I'll just want to write some simple code first to test whether our setup is working. Package main, import fmt, and then func main fmt printf hello world. And I'm going to save this. And install this one as well. Go import. This will automatically import our libraries when we need them. Once this is finished, I'm just going to close it again. So this is succeeded. I'm going to close this again. Open Visual Studio Code. And let's see where we are now. Still need to add a few more things. And then let's also open a terminal. And in this terminal, I'm just going to type go mod init hello world to initialize our module. And then this red line will go away after some time. And we should be able to run our first program. So let's see if we can run it or whether we need another restart. So when we run it, the output is going to be in our debug console. Go run, run without debugging. And it says hello world. That's what you should be able to see. Start debugging. Let's try with debugging. That should also work. And this is when DLV is used. So this DLV you need for debugging. Hello world, that also works. And let's now try to go to our terminal. And you can also run in VS Code in Windows this program, either using go run main.go or go run and just a dot. So on macOS, what I'm doing in this course a lot is go run star.go, but that doesn't work here on Windows. So whenever you, I use go run start at go, go run and then just a dot also works. So if you have any problem with this, make sure that go extension is installed, that you close Visual Studio Code, that you open it again, and that you install all these tools that Visual Studio proposes you to install. Go outline, go PLS, and so on to install those. And then if I exit again, Now you see the red line is also gone. Now it all works. So I will start with a simple program again in one of the first lectures. The goal of this lecture is just to have your ID installed to be able to run a simple program without errors from the terminal or using the debug console. 
In this section, we are going to write our first Go application. We'll end up with a full working example. And we're going to start from a simple hello world. And then we're going to build up until we have this full working example. I'm first going to cover command line arguments. And then we are going to make API calls. API calls from a Golang program are often used. So that's why I picked this as a first example for our first application. We're going to do JSON parsing because our test server that we are going to use is going to reply JSON. I'm going to explain you about the functions, custom error handling. I will then explain you the flag package. We're going to do a post request. So first we did a get request, then I will do a post request. I will do some explaining about JLT authentication and how you implement that in Go. Then we're going to package our code, test our code, and then we will have a full working example that will be our first Go application. So quite soon, in one of the first lectures, we're going to start to build our HTTP client. This HTTP get client on the left is what we are going to build. And it's going to make a connection to our test server. And this test server is not something we're going to focus on now. It's going to be pre-built. We're just going to start it. It's going to be an API server that's going to respond with JSON JavaScript objects. We are going to invoke get requests to the test server endpoints and we will get JSON objects back that we will need to parse. Then we will also investigate how we do post requests. We will need to do a post request on a login endpoint to receive a token, a JLT token, that we will then need to access protected APIs. So what I try to do with this HTTP get client is to give you a nice example of invoking APIs, as this is the foundation of what you need to know to build applications that will interact with external APIs. Later on, when we will be using SDKs in Go, you will see that they will make these API calls for us. So when we are going to interact with an external system, it is often going to be an HTTP API call to connect to an external service. So learning how you make requests and how you can parse JSON objects or any other structure that an API would give us back is for me the first big step in learning how to use Golang in a cloud or cloud native environment. Let's start with our first Golang project. I opened Visual Studio Code and this is the welcome page that opens. And I'm gonna create or open a folder. And in that folder, I'm going to create our first Golang program. So here you can start with open or you can use file open folder. That should be the same where you click. We just have to open a folder and that folder is going to be our project folder. I have a folder Golang demos that is empty. I'm going to use this folder to create my demos in. So I'm going to click new folder. Hello world. I'm going to call this new folder. I am now in hello world. And I'm going to open this folder. So whenever I create a new file in Visual Studio Code, it will appear in this hello world folder. This is my hello world project. So I can click here on create new file or I can right click new file. And the first file I'm going to call main.go. And this main.go is going to have our main function. It doesn't really matter what you give as a file name for your first program. What determines how it's going to be executed is going to be the name of the first function, which is always called main if you want to execute an executable. So this is our main.go and this is going to be in executable. That means that we are going to be able to run this. Later on, we will also create libraries. So libraries are not standalone. They also need other Golang code to be able to use those libraries. And this is not, this is, this is not going to be a library. It's going to be in executable. So once we write our code, we can then execute this program and it's going to output something. When in Visual Studio Code, it shows red. That means that there is a mistake somewhere. If you hover over it, it says expected semicolon 
and found end of file. That means that we have to still write something to make sure that this Golang file is going to compile. Once it is compiled, we can then execute it. So let's write a little bit of code, the simplest code that we can write to execute a program, just to just printing something on the screen, and then we can compile it and then run it. If you are going to write an executable, it always needs to be in the main package. So we first have to define what package we are going to use. We can see a package as a grouping of Go files. So this package is going to be called main. Package main. And you see the red color is already gone. I'm going to save this. And this is actually what Golang requires. It requires that the first line is a package definition, package main. If you want to execute this file in an executable, Golang is going to look for the function main. So let's try to write this function main. If you want to write a function, we type f-u-n-c, func, from the word function, a space, and then the name of the function. If you're going to use the function main, then when we execute this file, this is the function that's going to be executed. We have two brackets after the main because there's no parameters that we're going to pass to this function. This function doesn't require any parameters. And then to define the start and stop of this function, we're going to use curly brackets. One curly bracket after the main function and then one to, to stop it. We can save this. And this is actually our first Golang program that should be able to be executable, but it's not going to do anything because we haven't written anything in between. How do we execute it? In Visual Studio Code, we can open a new terminal. The new terminal will open in the directory that we specified, the hello world directory. We should have Golang installed. So if I type go version, I have go 1.18.1. If I want to compile Go in a terminal, so with commands, we can also execute it in Visual Studio Code, but I prefer to execute it always within a terminal. I find that that is easier. Go build main.go. Now it has been built. On Windows, you will have to type there. Here on macOS or Linux, you can type ls. Now we have a main executable which we can execute. So on, Mino, on Windows, you would just type main and on Linux or Mac, you can type dot slash main and then this program will execute. It doesn't give any output because there's no output. We haven't written anything yet. So let's try to write something in this main function so that if we build it and execute it, that we will see some output. So there's actually a shortcut when you are developing instead of using go build main go and then main, you can also do go run main.go. And that will just compile it and execute it immediately. And then you don't have to enter the two commands. So that's what I will be using. If you want, you can also run it here, start debugging or run without debugging within Visual Studio Code. But I will use the terminal because I find it a bit easier. So in our main package, we have the main function. And then let's try to write our first line of Golang. If you want to print something on the screen, there's a package FMT. This FMT package is provided by Golang itself. It's not an external dependency, it's an internal dependency. So it will always be provided within the language itself. So if you type FMT, then now we can start using functions of this FMT package and it will automatically be imported by Visual Studio Code once we start doing that. So if you, want to use an, if you want to use functions from another package, you need to import it, but you typically don't have to write the import lines in Visual Studio Code because it will do that for you. So if you type FMT and then a dot, we will see the functions that are available for us. And if you just wanna print something on the screen, we can use printf or println to message something on the screen. And you see what happened here. Once I selected println, 
then it adds this import FMT. So now we can use the FMT package and in the FMT package, we can use functions. Print ln is a function, print line, and FMT is the package and the separator is a dot. So you will always see that once you want to use a function from another package, you just enter package name dot function name and then you can use this function. So it's a function. So we're going to have to add brackets. If you want to know how we, how we can use this function, we can hover over the function name and it will explain what it does. Print on formats using the default formats for its operands and writes to the standard output. So it's writes to the standard output. Within this function, it expects any kind of variable. So we're going to pass a string. In Golang, a string is denoted by quotes, double quotes, hello world. I'm going to save this and then it's going to print hello world. And because it's print line, it's going to add a return after that. So we don't have to do that ourselves. Go run main.go, hello world. So this is our first Golang program that just prints something very simple on the standard output using the FMT package. So if you rather like to execute something within Visual Studio Code itself, you can go to run, run without debugging. And then it actually says that you need a go mod file. So you need a go mod file, which is the module file, which manages the dependencies, which we haven't created yet, but it's very easy to create. So if you want to use the built-in functionality of Visual Studio Code, we can do go mod init and we can give our demo a package name, for example, hello world. And now we have go mod here and it says, if you do go mod tidy, it will also check all the module requirements and download the necessary external modules. We don't have any external modules. So let's try to just do a run without debugging again. And then it also outputs hello world. And what has been created is just then this file, this go mod file. This is our module hello world go 1.18. You can still run go mod tidy, but it's not going to do anything because we don't have any external dependencies at this time. I'll come back to this later on when we're going to have external dependencies. Now we can just ignore this go mod file. In my demos in GitHub, you will also see that I have this go mod file everywhere defined so that you can run always the demos in Visual Studio Code. So that is it for our simple Hello World Golang application. Let's have a look at another package to see how we can pass arguments to our executable. So if you want to pass arguments, we want to do a go run main.go. And you want to, for example, pass argument one. So if you pass this argument, it still gives hello world, but now we want to capture this argument and just output it. So to capture arguments, we need another package, the OS package. So before we print our output, we want to say our arguments equals OS args and args a hold the command line arguments starting with the program name. And it returns from this operating system package a string, a string slice, which is the same as an array. So it's not just one string, it's multiple strings. We still get an error, two errors. The first error is because we don't have the OS name declared because we also need to import it. So if you just hit save, then Visual Studio Code will import this for us. And then we have also arcs. Arcs is undeclared by the compiler. So we need to declare it first. And this needs to be of type string. So there's two ways in Golang to declare it. We can either say that we have this variable declared before we use it like this var arcs string. And then we can use it later on to assign it to arcs and then we can print it. So now it still gives an error because we are not using it yet. But this is the first way of declaring and then using or assigning something to this arcs variable, which is a slice of strings 
or in Golang, it is actually also possible to not do this, but just add a column in front of the equal sign and then it will automatically declare this variable. So now the error that we have is it is declared but not used. So now it is declared. If it is the first time that you're using a variable, you can just use this colon sign and then depending on what the variable on the right side will output, a string slice in this case, then Golang will declare it. So now we still now we still need to output it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this print ln print line in print f. And print f stands for format, so then I can use then I can format my string. So I say hello world, and then I'm gonna add a return, backslash n is return, and I'm gonna say arguments and now I can format my string. So if you want to insert something in the string, you can use a percent sign and then S for a string, or you can use V just for the value. And then with V, then Golang, the printf function in Golang will decide itself what is going to output. So this is the default, the default output, which is good in our case, because we just want to output a string slice. We add another backslash N because we want another return at the end. And then we need to specify the variable that needs to be put in place here. So we can add another argument to this function and we can say just output arcs. So arcs, the output of arcs will go right here, will be replaced and then output it. Arcs contains all the command line arguments, including the starting with the program name. So the program name is going to be main. If the program executes successfully, it will be main and then the argument one. So let's have a look. Go run main.go argument one. So it says hello world. Arguments, arguments, and then we have our main. So what go run does is it actually compiles it in a temporary directory. So this is a temporary directory. This is our main program name. And then we have our argument. So if you want to use this argument one in our program, how do we extract this second element in our string slice so they can use this in our program? We typically want to do something with all the arguments, not only the first argument. So if you would add another argument, argument two, then we have the main argument one and argument two. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we don't have the program name, but just our arguments. So then we can work with string slice functions, string slice functions. So this is a string slice of three elements now, and we can slice this up in different ways. So that it only outputs the two last elements of this string slice. We can say as a second argument, so this is this is our OS args output, and then we only want to see the ar arguments, then we can say I'm going to use args, which is a slice. And with square brackets you can denote what argument you want. So if you want to only show argument, if you only want to show the second element, then you can enter one because we start counting at zero. So zero will be this argument main and then one will be argument one because we start counting from zero. I'm going to save this, execute it. And then you can see hello world. This is the full string slice. And if you just specify the second element with number one, then we see argument one here. And I didn't add another enter, so that's why it looks a bit strange here. I'll add another enter. So this, so this is argument one. And you see there's no square brackets anymore around it, because this is not a slice anymore, this is just a string. So this, so when you, you, when you specify one element, this is now a string. 
But we don't really want just one element. We want to see all the elements after are executable. So we want to see argument one and argument two. We can say within Golang, when working with slices, one is my starting position. And if I add a column, I can also specify the end position. The end position is going to be one, two, three. So three is going to be the end position, which is also the length of the slice. So to know the length of a slice, you can use the function, the built-in function len. So if I say len arcs from one to len arcs, it will give me starting from one. So not from zero, starting from one. So it will start here. All the arguments after argument one. So argument one, argument two, and if there's an argument three, it will also add argument three. Because with the input that I have here, it will be give me the, sli the slice elements, which will be another slice actually, not just one element, but another slice. Give me another slice starting from one to the end of this slice. So one, which is this one, the length will be two. So from one to two, one, two. If we have three arguments, it will be one to three, one, two, and then the third argument. But we can see that there, there is a recommendation here. The recommendation here in Visual Studio Code is actually to not put this one, because if we just remove this and we say from one to, and we leave the space empty, it will automatically go until the end. It will automatically take the length of the slice. So the easiest way to understand how to work with this is to just try it out yourself. So if I save this and do go run, then the arguments are now argument one, argument two. And if I do argument three, if I add argument three, it will show argument one, two, and three. And if I then change it in another number from, for example, one to two, and I execute argument one, two, and three, I will only get argument one because it went fr from this zero, argument one, start from here and end at element two, but don't include element two. So we stop here and we'll only get argument one. If we change this to three, then we get argument one and two. And if we change this to the length, if we have three arguments, then the length will be four, one, two, three, four. So if you would change this to four, then we get argument one, two, and three. But you have to be careful though, because we need to do some extra checks as well. And that I will explain in the next lecture. If we would say, give me argument one, two, five, but don't include the fifth one, I actually get a slice bounce out of range error because we only have the capacity four and I'm asking for a range of five, which means that I'm asking for something that's not there. And then Golang will throw an error. So to get used to how to work with slices in Golang, it's best to try it out yourself by changing these values a little bit and see what you get as output. Just remember that the first argument here is the starting point. The second argument here, the five, is the end range, but it doesn't include the actual element. And we start counting from zero. So arcs zero is the first element, arcs one, the second element. So here we start from the second element. We go to the fifth element, but we don't include the fifth element. So play around with it a little bit, and then you will get used to how slices work. Then the last thing I want to explain is how do you run this within VS Code, within Visual Studio Code. So if you want to run arcs one, one to the end in VS Code, run, run without debugging. And then we have to go to the debug console. And then here we have hello world, the arguments, but the argument list is empty because we didn't pass any arguments. So how do we pass arguments? Go 
run and we can add a configuration. This will create the launch.json file within VS Code. And here you can then create your configurations. So here we have one configuration, launch package, go launch. And we should be able to add, we should be able to add the arguments right here. We put a comma on the last element here. So this is JSON. And then here you have arcs. And arcs is an array in JSON. If you want to pass one argument, we say argument one. We save this back to our main, run without debugging. And then here we have now argument one. So you can have your launch.json where you can define extra arguments and then they will appear here in the debug console in the output when this program is executed. So when you want to pass arguments to your program, you can do that here. In the previous lecture, we just outputted our arguments. But what if we want to use a specific argument? So let's say we always want to use our first argument, which will be the second element. We refer to it as number one, element one, because we have element zero. So this is element one, this is the first argument. So first argument is gonna be argument one. So what if we execute our program with one argument, it will show our first argument. But what if we execute it with zero arguments, we'll get a runtime error. So what we want to do is we want to avoid getting these runtime errors. If we want to for sure use our first argument to execute our program, we need to check on this because the index is out of range on this array. So this OS args is a string, string array, holds the command line arguments. First is our name of our program. So we want at least two elements. If you have more, that's okay. But if you have less, then we need to we need to throw an error. So how do we check? How do we check the length of our string array? We can use the len function. And here you will see the help of the len function. If you use the len function on an array, on a pointer, or on a slice, it will all be a little bit different. For example, if it's just a string, it will return the number of bytes. If it's an array or a slice, it will return the number of elements in this array or slice. And this is also a good time to explain the difference between an array and a slice. So we don't really have to do anything different in Golang to work with an array or with a slice because it's all transparent for us, but there is actually a difference between an array and a slice. So when we, when we are outputting everything of the string array here as from the second element, from argument one up to the end, that is a slice. So it's a dynamic view of an array. And that is the difference between a slice and an array. A slice can be of dynamic length. And that's what you should remember. Slices are always of dynamic length, whereas arrays are of static length. And you don't need to think about it much because when you pass an array or a slice, it's passed in the same way. It is just sometimes that you have to take into account, for example, with the length function, that there is actually a difference between an array and a slice. And that will always be documented in those built-in functions. In general, you probably always use slices because the length of them are dynamic. And you don't really have to think about how many elements can there be maximum in this slice. So len arcs, if it's, if it's less than two, we are going to return an error. We can say the usage of this program is hello world. If you compile it, we will call it hello world argument. New line. And then we can exit after this. If we want to exit, we can use OS exit. 
and then you can enter a code, which is an integer between zero and 125. If you exit a program with error code zero, it was successful. Anything else is not successful. So we will say OS exit one. It was not successful because we were missing an argument. I will save this, go, go run main.go, usage hello world, and then the argument. Exit state is one because we added this line. If I type this echo dollar sign question mark, it will return the exit code of the last command. It is one. So when we are scripting and we are executing a Golang program and based on whether it was successful or not, we want to execute maybe something else, we can use this. We can use this exit code and we can say, okay, we need to stop now because this Golang program didn't execute properly if it was not returning zero. If you pass one argument, then the first argument will be argument one. We didn't get an error because we checked on this. Echo dollar sign question mark will return zero because it was successfully executed. We can still have more arguments. Argument two will also still execute because what I did here is I'm still passing this slice to my printf. The slice is representation of the second element to the end. Going to save this and then in the next lecture we'll be able to use th these lines of code because now we are sure that the first argument is passed because we are checking the length of the arguments and we will not get an error anymore when we are going to use this, this first element as an input for our program. Before we stop with this lecture though, I still want to show you something. We have here args equals OS args, but how did this args actually get populated? How, how is it possible that we, we actually got these values in there? Because we're just assigning this variable to our own local variable here, but how come that this actual contains those arguments? So let's have a look. If you right click here, we go to the definition, we will actually go into the OS package and have a look at the, at the Golang code in this OS package. So here the args is declared in this OS package. And these packages, they also can have an init function. So we have the package OS and here we have the init function. And this init function will be executed when we start using the OS, this OS package. And here in this init function, which is written by the Golang developers, the Golang developers will then check is our runtime windows if not, there's another init function for Windows in exec Windows. If we are on Linux or Mac, like for on our platform Diamond, then we're going to execute runtime args. And runtime args is then declared here. This is the signature of the function, but it actually the actual content is in another package. It's in the runtime package. So when we are developing Golang, we don't really have to care that much about the runtime as long as we are not doing any system calls. But here they are doing some more tricks here than what we would just write as normal Golang code. So this is the proc.go. We can do the same with printf. So if you want to see the fmt printf function, then we can right click here as well. And then here we have the print.go that has a printf, sprintf, fprint and other functions. You typically don't use it on the built-in packages, but if you have external packages, then you will see that to understand these external packages, you often have to look into the code, not often, but it happens where you look into the code just to understand what they are actually doing in this package. So now we have our arguments. We are checking on the arguments. We need at least one argument. We can use this for our next demo. We can use this argument, this first argument to supply some input to our program. In this lecture, I'm going to show you my Golang cheat sheet, which is just a one pager that shows code examples, which is very handy in case you're not familiar with Go and you're still learning it and you want to know the syntax of the programming language. You can print this one pager and keep it handy for when you're writing code and you forgot how to do something, then you can just have a look on this one pager. I will attach this PDF as a resource of this lecture 
so that you can also download it. And I'll keep it up to date, so I'll make some changes even after this lecture. And as we progress with the course, I will also explain more things on this cheat sheet. So now I will just explain a few basics on this one pager, just to get you started. This is how the current version looks like. And you see there's still some white space, so it's definitely not complete. And for now, I'm going to focus on the left part of this one pager, the variables, types and conditions, and maybe also the operators so that we have the first two columns covered. Let's start with the variables. How to declare a variable in Go? You can use var a is a string. We can also declare a variable var a is a string and immediately give it an initial value. We say here that it is a string, but it's not quite necessary. We can also let the compiler figure out the type. So we can say the type is inferred when we say var a equals string. The Go compiler will see this is a string, so this a will now be a string. The shortest notation is actually a colon equals something, and then you don't even need a var keyword. So I will most of the time use this notation where we say a colon equals something, and a will become then of type string. This colon is only necessary when you are declaring a new variable. Once you want to assign something else, you can just say a equals. You can also say a and b equals 1, 2. a will be equals to 1 and b will be equals to 2. And you will see this notation also a lot when we are executing functions. Where a function returns two variables, we will say a will be the variable for the first return value and b will be the variable for the second return value in case of a function. So this is the basics of declaring variables and initializing var variables. Next is a map. So a map is something that you will see in one of the next lectures. A map holds a key value pair. Here we declare a map. So var a string, string is a type. var a, now the type is map string string. The first string stands for the key and the second string stands for the value. You can also make it shorter by using the make function. So a colon equals make a map of string string. So now you're making a map where also still the key is string and the value is string. You can also initialize a map immediately with initial values. Here the k is a key and v is the value. And if you would add a comma here, then you can also add more key value pairs. So this is a map. Don't worry too much about it. If you are not familiar with it, we will start using this in one of the lectures. And then you have an array and a slice, which we also will use gradually in our demos. An array is fixed size and a slice is dynamic. Var d, instead of var a string, we have var d, and then the type is of array with size two integer. Here we are also initializing an initial value. The initial value is an integer array of size two, and the value is 1, 2. So the first element is 1, second element is 2. When you declare a slice, you don't have to specify the size of your array because the size is dynamic. So here we have var a of string. It's a string slice. It can contain multiple elements, but we do not need to add the size. We can also use the make functions it's just like we were doing with the map. Here we make a string slice of size 5. We will also start using these make functions in our lectures. Here we have a make function where you make a slice of size 5, but with capacity 10. So you can give another argument to allow for more capacity. So they are dynamic, so they will increase if we start putting more than 5 elements in it. But here we are already saying we want to have the capacity of 10. So if you already know that there's going to be five more elements, then we can make a new slice. We only want to have five elements in there, so five elements will be 
empty strings, but we will still have capacity for five more before we have to allocate more memory to expand our string slice. We then also have a way to declare multiple variables. So we can just use a var with run brackets and then we can line by line declare our variables. A is a string, B is an integer. So this is a little bit easier to declare multiple variables. And then we will also be working with structs, structures. A struct groups multiple variables together. This is how we declare it. We say type my struct. So this name you can choose is of type struct. And within my struct, I have just one string. So here you can group together multiple variables. So you can have D string, E string, if you wanted. Here we just have one. This is how we define our type. And then we can create a new variable, declare A using the my struct type. So this is a type of struct. My struct goes right here. This is a type. And we can then say for A is of type my struct. In my struct, we have the string. So that means that we can also say, I want A as a new variable. And it's going to be of type my struct. And within my struct, and now we're going to use curly brackets, we can say C, C comes from here, is a new string. So we have now a struct, and C is a new string. That's a variable within the struct. If you wouldn't specify a string, we would just take the first element in our struct. So these lines are actually the same. If we later on want to refer to this C within my struct A, or we want to change it, then we can say a dot c, which refers to the c within the struct, and we can change it to a string, for example. In the lectures, you will also see that we have struct slices or struct arrays. So you can have structs within a slice or within an array or within a map to make complex data structures. And then we have the types that are built in in Go. So you have the bool, which is true or false, a string, this is a string, a byte, which is an alias for unsigned int 8, if you will have to work with bytes, a rune, which is a representation of a UTF-8 character, it's an alias for int 32, and if you would use single quotes here, single quote S for example, then that would be a rune. So if you use A colon equals single quote S, then A would be a rune. Float 32 and float 64, if you want to work with floating points, so 1.32, for example, would be a float. Then we have integers, so the size of int depends on whether you're on a 32 or 64 bit system. If you are on a 64 bit system, then this is going to be of size 64, otherwise on 32 it would be 32. So int, and then you have int 8, 16, 32, and 64. Typically you would use int if you want to use an integer. And then you have the same in the unsigned form, which means that you can only have positive numbers, but then you can obviously store more numbers. And you have an unsigned int pointer, which can hold a pointer address. And then you have complex 64 and complex 128 for complex numbers. Those variables that you're going to create, you can then compare using conditions. So we have less than, greater than, less than equals, greater than equals, equals and not equals. So they are very similar as in other languages. Logical operators, or operator, and the end operator, and the not operator. If A is greater or equals than 10, and B is greater or equals than 10, then execute something. Else, if not A less than 5, then do something, and otherwise execute this block. So with if, else, if, and else, you can create conditions. And in Go, you also have switch. You can write a switch for A, which means you can then check what is the value of A. In case the value of A is 5, then you can do something here. You can have multiple cases, and you can also have a default, which is optional. So if you have case 5 only, and A is 4, then it would automatically go to the default. So this is the switch notation. And then you have operators like plus, minus, multiplication, and so on. Some simple examples are A is 
5 plus 5, so that would then be 10. a plus equals 5, which is the same as a equals a plus 5. So if 5 is 10, then you would just add 5 more, which is 15. And also you can have b equals a condition. So is a greater or equals than 5? If yes, then return a Boolean, which would be true. So b would be of Boolean type and would contain true. If b was an integer, then you could do b++, which means that you're going to increase b by 1. And you could also do b minus minus, which is going to decrease b by 1. I will stop here and let you continue with the actual course material. You can print this and keep this close to you when you are following the course. And in case that you want to know how a variable is declared or what a specific type is or how to write conditions, then you can have a look at this one pager. In one of the next lectures, I will then explain more items on this page when it is relevant to start explaining them. In this demo, I will show you how to make an HTTP GET request. So we're going to run a server. I have a Golang server that we can start. And then we are basically going to write a client. We are going to make a connection to an HTTP server and just output what it returns. We're going to output the HTTP code and the HTTP body. And this is the first step to actually use APIs, external APIs, because if you want to use an external API, you will need to do HTTP requests or at least some kind of connection request and retrieve the data, parse the data, do something with the data and then maybe make another connection request. So the easiest way to show this is to make an HTTP request and show the information on it. Then in the next demos, I will explain you how to parse the data and to how to do the error handling and so on. So we can use this argument as our URL that we want to reach. So we can say we are going to write a program HTTP get, we expect a URL, and then we're going to make connection to this URL. If we don't get a URL, we'll throw this error, we will explain the usage. So what do we do? What is the first step is to make sure that the parameter passed is actually a URL, because if it is not, we should also throw an error. How do we validate whether it is an URL? We can use some Golang packages that have this functionality in it. How do you find these Golang packages? You can have a look on the website. You can just type in Google. You will find a Stack Overflow thread, or you will find some help documents that show you what is the easiest way to parse. But the first way in Golang to find something, to do something should always be, is there an internal package? Is there a package provided by Golang that can actually satisfy my needs? And for us, because we just want to parse a URL, it is actually included in Golang. There is a URL package and that URL package we will use to parse our potential URL that we are passing as an argument. So how do we do that? We just want to validate it. So we don't really need to do anything with the output. We just want to know whether it's a valid URL. So there's a package URL and it has the parse request URI. Parse request URI parses a raw URL into a URL structure. If it is not a URL, it will return us an error code. So this is the function signature, func. This is how we use it, url.parse request URL. We pass a string and it will return a URL, a URL type that is defined within this URL package and an error if it cannot parse it. So while this is handy to receive this URL type that we can then use to get a part of, it, of the information out of it to, for example, see whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, we don't necessarily need this because we only want to validate whether it is a URL or not. So let's start with passing our string. So we're going to pass args and our second element within the array, which is number one. And then this will then return the URL and the error. So we will say my URL and then this is the error equals this 
function. So in my URL, I will now have URL URL. And in this error, I will have an error. And I only want to check on this error. I don't really need this one. So if you don't need a variable, you can actually replace it by an underscore. So if I put an underscore here, I show to the compiler to go like that. I don't need this. You can just ignore this first argument. I am only interested in this argument, the error argument. And if this error argument contains an error, then I want to stop the program. So what I can do is I could enter here and start a conditional, just like I did here. I can write if, if our, if our error is not equals to nil, then it will contain an error and then I will do something. But there is a shorter notation. And if you are checking on errors, it's very handy to use a shorter notation. I can say if, and then my statement. So first it will execute my statement and then I use a semicolon and then I can write my test. My test is going to be if my error is not equals to nil, which means that there is something in this error, then I will output the error and exit. So this error is of type error and this error is basically just a string or empty. If it is empty, it will be equals to nil. So if it's not nil, it contains an error. And then I can say usage HTTP get URL. URL is in invalid format. And the actual error is a string of the error. So this will just output the error. So we can save this. So now at this point, we are sure that args, the, the second element of args is a valid URL and we can then use this to do our HTTP request. How do we do an HTTP request? Well, Golang also has an HTTP package, HTTP. And then here we have all the functions that we can use, including the get function. So this will do an HTTP get. Can I have another look at the function signature? It accepts a URL and then there's a response and again an error that it is being returned. So we can pass the URL, which is still this one. We can also, if you want, assign a local variable that just says URL or hostname and do hostname equals args one so that you don't have to repeat this parameter. And then it will give us a response and an error. So again, we could wrap this into an if, if you want to. So we can say if and then semicolon, but then we actually will have an issue with variable scope, because if you do that, if response error, if error is not equals to nil, then right here, we are not able to use response. Response is actually undeclared, whereas here, response is declared. You see the error here is different. The error here is, is undeclared and here it is like, okay, it's not used. So if you use an if and we declare our variables within the if, in within the conditional, only within the conditional can use the variables and outside you cannot. So this can easily be changed by declaring it higher outside the conditional and now here you can see variable of response is not used, but it's actually, it is declared, so we can use it here. Depending on, on, depending on what you like most to declare your variable here, or to not use this shorter statement, you can actually just split it up like this again, and then your response will actually be scoped to the function and not just to the conditional. And to me, that's just an easier way of working. So we're going to do an HTTP get of our URL. It returns an, a response, which is of type HTTP response and an error. Also, if you see this star in front of HTTP response, that means that we are getting a pointer back. 
I want to have a separate lecture about pointers in general. Don't think about it too much. Just don't use pointers only when you need to use it. And right now for our simple programs, we don't really need to use pointers so we can just ignore it. If we have an error, we're going to quit our program. But we're going to quit our program in a different way because it's not a user error. It's a system error. We actually want to see the, the error completely. So then you can use log fatal. Fatal is equivalent to print followed by call OS exit one. So you could do it nicely and do an FMT print F, or you can just do this log fatal, which will exit our program. And we can just pass our error as a parameter. So you can do it either way. You can do it like this, or you can just do it like this. Why do I do it like this here and, and here different? Because we want to have more user-friendly errors here. So if the user does something wrong, we just want to have very user-friendly errors. You might want to have user-friendly errors here as well. But if we are just writing this program for ourselves, then log fatal error will do. Undeclared name log, we still need to save. Okay, and then log will be imported. And then we have no errors here anymore. Response will still show an error because we haven't used it. So if there is no error, response will have the HTTP status code, like 200 is okay, 404 is not found, 500 is server error and so on. And it will also have the body. But the body is actually special. The body of the page can be bigger than our memory that we have available. So our body might not contain all the data from the HTTP output. So it's wrapped in a different variable and that variable is a stream. Once our program exits, we need to make sure that we close that stream. And to do that, we can use another keyword that we haven't used before. It's called defer. Defer response body close. That means that once this function is finished, then at the end, our body, which is our HTTP body, it will be closed. So if you have a look at this explanation here, the body represents the response body. The response body is streamed on demand as the body field is read. It's streamed on demand. So it doesn't contain all the information yet, because let's just imagine that we are downloading hundreds of megabytes of content. If it would all be downloaded instantly, then we would get an out of memory error. And that's why it is streamed and not all read at the same time. So that's why it's wrapped in a stream. And at the end of our program, we just have to close our stream. It's what you should do. It's to keep it all working correctly. So if you would have a different function, if you wouldn't have the main function, but a different function, then at the end of the function, it would close the body because at that point we don't need it anymore and we can close it. It's not going to immediately close it. It's because we use this defer keyword only here when we are at the end, it will then close this body. So now we can use this body. We are, this body is streamed on demand, but we actually want to read all of it. Why do we want to read all of the body? Because we are actually working with very small outputs, JSON output often on HTTP calls. So if you know that everything fits in memory, you can just read it at once. We know that our JSON, our output will fit in memory, so we can read it all at once. How do you read it all at once? There's another function built in Golang for that. It's called IO read all. Read all will read from a reader, from an IO reader. It is a stream and it will read until the end of file. So we can say read all, response body, and then response body, and then what does it output? It outputs bytes and error. So we can say body error equals I read all. We just test again whether we had an error. And if we have no error, we can now output our body. Our body is an array of bytes. So we still would have to transform this into a string, but there is a simple string function for that. Let's do fmt printf HTTP status code, which is going to be a number, so it's a decimal, and then we can enter a new line, and our body is a string. Where is this HTTP status body? Also in the response 
here we are using response body but if you do response and we put a dot we can see that there's other fields that we can use you have the content length and the status code so status code it is an integer that's why you use percent sign d and then we just need a body let's try to just use body this is of byte let's save this let's do a return and we ask output the body as a string so let's go to my github repository so if you haven't cloned it yet make sure that you clone it my git repository golang for devops course.git then we can go into this directory and here we have here we have the test server within this test server we have the main.go so we can just do go run main.go or we can compile it or what is also what i also typically do is i do a go run star.go which will just run all the golang programs so if you split your main go out in multiple files then it will load all the files go run main.go this will start a server and this starts a server on port 8080 and i will just open a second screen here so now i have two terminals so let's have a look at this main.go it does a listen and surf of an HP server on 8080. And let's now do the go run of our main.go, which is the HP get file. Go run main.go. Make sure it's saved. And let's see what is the output going to be. Oh, I need to, of course, add an argument that's the whole idea so arcs1 is going to be my url hp localhost 8080 and then there's a words endpoint that should return some json and here we then have http status code 200 and this is the body the body is a string so the conversion between the bytes the byte array and string is actually done by our printf function because we are using this string. In some cases, if you need to transform your byte array into a string, you can also use string. So if you for sure want a string, you can use a string function and this will return a string. And this can be useful because sometimes it doesn't always know what to output if you have a, a byte array, because if you say I want to output a string, it will work, but I'm not 100% sure what it will do with the default value, because the default value is a byte. You see, so if I, I just change it now, you see, so it's actually the array of bytes. So this is how it looks. This is These are strings, these are letters, but they still need to, need to be converted from bytes to strings. So if you convert it to a string, this should work because now we are passing as an argument a string, or you can say, I can pass the body as a array of bytes, but printf needs to convert to string. Status code 200. So if I would try some other endpoint words, then I get status code 404, and then the body is 404 page not found. So this works. We are now making an HTTP call to our server with this HTTP get, this HTTP package. We get our response, our HTTP response, which has a body, which is being streamed, but we read all the data from our body, and then we output the body to the screen, which is just a JSON. In the next lecture, we will go over some more details, and then in the next demo, we can parse this JSON into a golang variable because now it's just a string but we can actually parse this so that's it if you get any error uh, make sure that you don't have anything else running on port 8080 if so you just wa might want to change this you can also edit this main.go 
and change this uh, port number if you already have something running on port 8080. So that's it. So our program is getting longer now and we already start to do something useful. Let's continue with our HTTP GET demo. I changed the contrast a little bit of my Visual Studio code. I hope this reads a little bit better than the previous lectures. I also made the text a little bit bigger, but I might have to make it a bit smaller again once we start working on bigger programs. We'll see. I think this is an improvement actually. So let's go with this. This is what we did in the previous lecture, HTTP GET of our URL. And we actually just outputted the body. Percent sign %s, we output the body. But in general, we are going to want to parse the output. We're going to want to put it in Golang variables. And we haven't really talked a lot about variables. Okay, we have the error type, we have the body type, which is byte. We have these custom types here, like a URL. But we haven't really created any type ourselves to capture, for example, the JSON in. So let's have a look at what types we need to create to capture this JSON. I have still my test server. So let's run the test server again. And then let's run this word endpoint. So this is the JSON that we want to parse. We have a page, which is a string, an input that is a string, and the words is an array. And this, this is actually written in a way that we can add some words. We can have an input and we can add some words so that it displays in the JSON array words. We can also go to this host name in the browser, and then we can add some words if you want, or we can also just pass it here. We can pass an input variable so our input can be word one. And then we have added word one to the words and our input is word. If we exit our test server, then it will be cleared again. So this is only, this is kept in memory. When we shut down our server, then it's gonna be gone. So we can add more words in a separate window in a browser, or you can just do it here, whatever you find easiest. So this is what we would like to parse. So we want to create a type in Golang to parse this output. So we have first page, which is a string, input string, words, array of strings. Golang provides a type that is similar to objects in JavaScript that bundles together multiple different types, like multiple strings or a string in an array. And it's called a struct. So we can define a new type of variable using the keyword type. And we can call this words, and this type is going to be a struct. And in this struct, we can then define the attributes that we would like to see in this words struct. And it's going to be page, input, and words. So I'm going to write page, which is a string, input, which is also a string, and words, which is an array of strings. So now we can parse this JavaScript object into a Golang struct. And we should be able to then read exactly the, the page or the input, like words or word one or a single element in the array, because when it outputs, it's just a string. When we outputted this right here, it's just a string, it's a body. We haven't parsed it into the smaller parts, into the attributes, the JSON attributes that we wanna see. So this is a struct, but we don't really have a translation yet, how a JSON attribute will translate to a Golang attribute within this struct. And in Golang, we can add metadata that then can be used by these packages that convert JSON strings to structs and structs to JSON strings. To add this metadata, we can use backticks. 
we can say JSON if you're going to parse, parse JSON and those JSON libraries will exactly look for these keywords. We are looking for the JSON attribute page when we are going to parse this. And here with input, we're going to look for the input attribute. And with words, we're going to look for the words attribute. And now that we are going to convert this, when we are going to use this JSON library that's going to convert this string into this struct, this JSON library will look for the for this metadata. And when it sees page and it matches, it will take take the value of that attribute and put it into our field, our struct field here. We map page, input, and words to our struct fields. So in the Golang we call this fields. We have one mistake here. I have a lowercase words here, and these are uppercases. And let's see what Golang has to say about this. Struct field words has JSON tag, but is not exported. So in Golang, when you use functions and when you use fields, and also with the types, you can export a field. So either you have a non-exported or an exported field, and this one is not exported. So with the JSON library, this will not work. The JSON library need exported fields. Otherwise, the JSON library, which is, which is a different package, cannot access directly these fields. So we need to change our lowercase w in uppercase w. So we always need uppercases here, otherwise it's not going to work. If you forget it, then Visual Studio Code will alert you on this. And so normally it's a mistake that is easily cut. So now I have page input and words. And the first letter is an uppercase so that these fields are exported so that external packages can access our fields. So I'm going to save this. And then we only want to parse our data if our response code is 200. So let's remove this print line and let's first check our HTTP status code. If our response status code is not equal to 200, so this is an integer. So when we have an integer, we need to compare to an integer. So if you would compare against a string, it would not work. You see, you cannot compare mismatch types int and untyped string. So if we compare the status code, it's going to be without quotes, 200. If it's not 200, we want to print a message and exit. So I'm just going to copy paste this message and exit. Response status code is not 200, invalid output, HP code is the status code, and then we can print the body. We can convert the body to a string or we can let printf convert it for us. If the status code is, is 200, we want to parse to this field word. So first we need to declare another variable. I will declare the variable words of type words. So this is type words, this is struct with the fields, and this is our variable that is declared, but not used yet. Now I'm going to use a JSON package to unmarshal our JSON string into a Golang struct. Unmarshal parses the JSON encoded data and stores the result in the value pointed by v. If v is nil or not a pointer, it will return error. So we need a pointer. So when we need a pointer, the external package will explain to us you need to use a pointer. So then we just need to supply a reference to these words instead of just passing words. So JSON unmarshal. What is our data? It's our body. And then any type we can pass, but it needs to be a pointer. So we're going to reference words and to reference, we can use the ampersand sign. If I would not put it, again, Visual Studio Code will alert me. You see it's underlined now. Call of unmarshal passes non pointer as second argument. So that's why we reference, we have a reference 
to this variable and then we basically pass the pointer and not just the argument. Unmarshall returns an error. Error equals JSON unmarshall. I don't need to put a colon here because we were using error earlier. So error will be already defined. We can just overwrite it. So why do we have error here? So why do we have a colon here? Because body was not defined, error was defined. So you still need the colon here, but here we don't need a colon. If anything goes wrong, we can again do a lock fatal. Now our words should contain the correct values. So I can now type fmt printf and output some of our words. JSON parsed, page, string, and I wanna, I wanna output all the words also as a string. And now I can say in my struct, I have words.page. So page is gonna be the field that's gonna be inserted here. And then I'm gonna do words.words which is an array of strings and I just actually want to return a string. So let me just change this in V, the default, and then it will just output for us a formatted array of strings. Let's test this out. Go run main.go. I'm not going to pass an input now because we just want to see the same JSON output. What do we see? Parsed, JSON parsed, page is words, and the words is word1. You see, and it's actually the fmt printf of this, of this value that puts these square brackets around it to print it. But let's say that we don't really like these square brackets and we just want to have a comma separate list of the words. Now we could actually parse this because now we have parsed the JSON and it's an array of strings. You have string functions in Golang in a string package and you can join an array of strings together and provide a separator. So let's try to do that. Strings dot join, join concatenates the elements of its first argument the array of strings to create a single string and the separator we can then define is placed between the elements. So we're going to join and our separate will be just a comma or a comma and a space to make it nice. And then we can save this. Visual Studio Code will import strings. We now have strings imported and we're going to join this array of strings or the slice of strings. It always accepts slices and arrays, so you don't really have to worry about a difference. Let's try to run it again. Ah, but we only have one word, so it's not going to show. Let's add another word, word2. So now we see if you add another input, we have words is word1, word2, and we see it is comma separated word one, two, and three. So we actually parsed our JSON. This was our JSON. And now we have all the values available within a struct. We have three fields. And now we can do operations on these three fields. We can check the length. We can check the first element, if it exists. We can use the input, we can use a page. So the first step when parsing JSON is to write a struct and then you can use the unmarshal function. There's also a marshal function to do it the other way around. If you have a struct, you can also convert it to a JSON string. And of course, there's also tools that can help you convert JSON to a struct. So if you write in Google or any search engine, JSON to struct Golang as a search string, then you will find web pages where you can just copy paste JSON and it will give you this output without the name of the variable, obviously, because the name I picked myself. So if you don't want to write it yourself or if you have big JSON structs, then the easiest way to have these structs is to just use one of these tools 
and then copy paste it and then give it potentially better names if you want to give it a nice name. So I want to say just one last thing that we now have used the string types, the string array types, and now this complex type struct is new, but you can obviously use different types here, different built-in types or different struct types as a field. And we'll have another lecture to go over more possibilities with some examples to show you other types that you can use, because these are just a few types that we have been using. In this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about interfaces. So if you go back to the demos and the code that I showed you in the previous lectures, I think I did a good job in explaining exactly what variables are returned, like a URL here, and how we are using these special types, like a response that you can actually have a response body within this type that you can then use or that there are functions within this type that you can use to close it. But that doesn't really show you what is under the hood. I just told you, you can use these variables like OS arcs, which are defined in a different package. But there is something, there is something missing here, something that I didn't explain yet, because we have this response body and this response body is of read closer and here we have a read all and it expects an io reader so our types are actually different here we expect an io reader but we are passing a read closer and if you have a look at our previous commands for example printf we always first provide a string so it's always a string type that we provide first and then this is a second argument of the any type so it can be an integer, it can be a string, it can be an array of strings. Printf will figure out for us how to parse it. And also you see the three dots in front of any, it's a slice, a slice of any. That means that this second parameter is optional and we can have zero or more of those any parameters. Or here we have exit, which expects an int or here we have a string, here we also have a string. So you see that in most of our functions we pass a type that it expects, but here in read all it expects an IO reader, but we are supplying an IO read closer. So let's have a look why this is possible, why can we sometimes supply a different type to a function and that still works in Golang. And let's have a look at this streaming function because this streaming function is actually quite important to understand how this works because it's so much used. So why don't we in this lecture write our own variable that we pass to read all, like a streaming variable where then read all will read all the data from. And then we will have an idea how this response body actually works. So I'm going to remove all these lines. We're going to keep the read all and we're going to create another variable of a specific type. And we're going to pass that to the read all method. Also, this is going to be a little bit more advanced lecture. So don't, don't worry if you don't immediately get it. This concept of interfaces will come back multiple times to uh, fully understand it later on. So let's first have a look at this read all. If I right click here and I say go to definition, I will see the function signature. And here we are using this read all IO reader. So once, once we are in the IO package, it is not going to show this prefix IO reader anymore. So if we go here, it shows IO reader, but once we are in a package, it is just called reader. And this reader, this type is defined within this OS package. So if I do right click and I go to the definition, I will go all the way up line 83. And here, this is defined. And this is a type interface. So we are not asking for a specific type like a string or array of strings. We are now asking for an interface. And what this interface means is that what you are supplying as, an, as a parameter to this function, it needs to have the function read. 
this function signature needs to be within that variable, needs to be available within that variable. So if we make our own variable that has within this variable, within this struct, if this struct has the function, and we didn't do this before yet, if this struct has the function read, then it satisfies our requirements to use this as a parameter, and then we can use it within this read all function. So let's try to go back to this read all function. It expects this reader, which is an interface, and this R variable has the read function. So within, within this function, the only thing we can do with R is we can do R.read. And if you have a look, where is R used? Here, R is used. So we can only do R read. We can only execute this function read from this parameter R to then read the data. So to read all the data from the parameter that we supply, we can only use the read function. So if we build our own variable that we're going to pass, it just needs to have the read function because that's what the interface says. The interface says, that is defined within this package, says you need to have the read function for every variable that you pass to this read all. And if that, if that is satisfied, then you will not see an error. And within this function, we, are, we can then only access that particular function because within read all, the only thing that we know is that this R has a read function. So let's try to implement that. And then we'll have our own reader where read all can read all the data from. So our implementation is just going to be a static string because it's going to supply a string to our reader and read all can then just read that string with the implementation that we did in our previous demos that was actually the http call that was happening so the http call was happening and then the endpoint would return some information like json and then read all would read that information so we are not going to make any connection we're just going to supply a static string so we don't need any of this anymore we just need to have the read all you can also just create a new project if you want to keep this code. And the code is also available on my GitHub repository. And once we have read the body, we can print it. Body or output. Body. Or we can maybe just call it out. And the parameter that we're going to supply is going to be our struct, a new struct a struct that we still have to make. So I'll just keep this empty for now. So I will call this new struct that I'm going this new struct that I'm going to create. I call it my slow reader. And why am I going to call this my slow reader? Because we are going to let the read all read one by one, one character by one. So it's going to be very slow, but it's going to be nice as an example. Type my slow reader is going to be a struct. What do I need in my struct? Well, I need to be able to supply a string because that's a string that read all is going to read. So I will just say contents. Contents is a string. How do I initiate a new variable with this type? I can do either this var my slow reader instance. It's an instance my slow reader is a type and this is now a new instance it's declared but not used it declares an empty instance of the struct but i don't really want to declare an empty instance i actually want to define also the contents already so there's another way to more easily declare it and that is by using this notation my slow reader instance equals my slow reader, and then I'm going to use a curly bracket. And then within this curly bracket, I can provide values for the fields that are defined within the struct. So I can say my slow reader contents, hello world. And I also need to supply a comma at the end because there can be other fields. So this is the contents field. This is my slow reader. This is a struct, this is an instance of the struct. So 
Now I just have this struct with contents in there. And this my slow reader instance I'm going to pass to read all. Let me save. So now my imports that I previously had are gone. Now I have one error. My slow reader instance. Cannot use my slow reader instance, which is a variable of type my slow reader, as IO reader value in argument to IO read all. So I'm trying to execute read all. I need to provide a type of IO reader. But why can I not use this? My slow reader does not implement IO reader. So I need to implement this interface. I need to be having this read method. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It says missing method read. So this assignment, this passing this parameter will not work because I don't have this read method. Let's have a look again at this interface, the reader interface. So this is the function that I need. So every struct can contain fields, but it can also contain functions. So this struct, my slow reader, can also have a function. I can say func, and then I need to define that this function is linked to my struct, my slow reader. So I say m space my slow reader. And this m is then the variable that I can use within this function if I want to reach any of those fields within the struct. So m.contents, for example, will give me the contents of this field. Func my slow reader. And then the function is going to be read, which is a copy paste of the interface function. Read will need one argument and returns an integer and an error. So there will be an error here, missing return. Let me just return something. If I am at the end of the file, and this is explained in the read all, read all reads from R until an error or end of file and returns the data it read it. So if I just say, actually, I didn't return any bytes because the first return argument will return how many bytes. I say, there's nothing to return, zero. And I say, IO end of file. So end of file is returned by read when no more input is available. If I use this, and I save this. And let's try to test this out. Let's go to the hello world directory. Actually, I'm still in my GitHub folder. So let me go to the hello world. You can also just close your terminal and open your terminal if you don't know anymore where you are. So I'm in my hello world project now. And then go run, start go. Output empty. So this actually ran, and what happened is it just returns zero and end of file. So, but what is really happening here? We can actually use debugging in Golang. So if I put a breakpoint and I do run start debugging, then here I can use go inside function or just continue or skip to the next one to have a look what is really happening. So I put a breaking point at read all, and let's now go in this read all method. And then this is the R, this is a reader, but it's actually my struct that is being passed, my slow reader. And if I continue, oh, I went too far. It actually executes the read function. So let's start over, let's restart, go inside this function. And when we hit the read function, let's go inside the read function, and then you see we are in our read function we have written. It just returns end of file. So then it continues. Is there an error? Yes, it's not nil. Is the error end of file? Yes. Then return B and B is our buffer where we put everything in, but our buffer is now empty because we didn't put anything in it. And then we output nothing. So our read function is executed, but we want to 
read the contents. And read will be executed until we say it's the end of file. So if you want to have a slow reading function and only read one character at a time, we can use built-in string slice functions in Golang to just return only one by one. But to return one by one the characters, we, we need to know where we are. So let's create another field, pos of type integer, which is just a number. And using this field pos, we, will, we can store the position that we are. So the only thing that we need to do is we need to read the string contents one character by one character, increment pos until we are at the end of the string. In other words, we can say only return something when pos is less than the length of the contents, because once our position is more than the length of the contents, then there's no characters left. So let's try to write it out. If pos is less than len contents, we're going to do something. Okay, we get two errors. Pos is not declared and contents is not declared because they are in the struct, they are fields of the struct. And that's why we have this m my slow reader. So this m refers to our instance of our struct. So if you want to access the fields, we say m.pos and m.contents. There is still one problem. When we defined our pos, it starts counting at zero. So if we say, if zero is less or equal the length of a content, so if we have one character, it's going to execute. And then what we want to do is m pos plus one. So we can do plus plus, which is plus one. Then the next iteration is going to be one and one is still equal to one so it will execute again but there will be no more contents because our length is only one so we ideally only want to execute it once if there's only one letter in our contents so if we say m plus plus one then for a length of one it will only execute once it will only iterate once if it's two then if it started one, then one is less than two, and then two is less than two, so it will execute two times. So I think that's what we want. So an integer starts at zero, but actually it's easier for us if we just start at one, and then we can compare it like this. The next step is to write data to this p variable. So if you have a look here, b is our buffer and b our buffer is passed to our read function and in this buffer we can actually write our contents and then this n is how many bytes have been read and this error here is either end of file or an error we can use to do to make a copy to make a safe copy the copy function the copy built-in function copies elements from a source slice, this is our source slice, into a destination slice, and this is a destination slice. As a special case, it also will copy bytes from a string to a slice of bytes. And that's what we need, this special case, because we have a string and we want to put it in a slice of bytes, and the slice of bytes is this one. And the output is the output is an integer, copy returns the number of elements copied. So that's what we need, because we need to return the number of elements copied and the error. So if we say n equals copy, destination is p, and our source, what is going to be our source? We want to copy one letter by one letter from the contents. So we can say contents, or m contents. And actually this will also work with a, a lowercase. So we can also have lower cases here because we don't really need to export this. 
n equals copy m contents. Now we will copy the whole string, but we won't do it letter by letter because we have a slow rear. Where do we want to copy it from? From our position, which is zero to start with. And what is going to be the end position? If you want only read one character by one character, it's going to be the position plus one. So if you have zero until one, this will reply h one to two is going to be zero because we start counting from zero. One, one is e, and then two is l, but we don't include l, so it is going to be e. So that should work. And then we still have n declared but not used. Return n and nil. That should be it. Let's save this. Let's try to debug this first because it's not going to work yet. There's still something that is not correct. But I want to show you that during the debugging, my slow reader instant read has been executed. We have p, which is an empty byte array, and then our position is going to be zero. Length of contents is not showing when I hover over it, but zero is definitely smaller than the total length. So we can copy into P our H. Look, here is the first H. We increase the position and we return N. N is one, one character. Character H has been written into our buffer. So I'm just going to hit continue now. And now we are the second position. And now there's something interesting that happened. So our M position is still zero, even though we increased it. And this comes, this, the reason behind this is that my slow reader is being executed again. And the contents, the changes that we made to the fields are not saved because we are passing it as a copy and not as a reference. So this is one of these use cases where you actually need pointers. And we are just going to say that this my slow reader here needs to be a pointer. So my slow reader, what we pass here is a pointer so that we can actually make changes. So M is a pointer to my slow reader struct and not a copy of the struct. And then here, the implementation is now done as a pointer, so we also need to pass this as a pointer. So here we can say my slow reader, we add an ampersand here, this is a, a reference. And now this will be sent as a pointer. Whether you have to use an ampersand or a star, we'll have no lecture going into the details of that. But for now here, this is now sent, this M is now a pointer. This my slow reader is now also sent as a reference because it's it's a referenced here. Let's try to execute it again. Run, start debugging. So this is the first execution, second execution. Now it's one, now it's two. And if you have a look here, now we add the L. Now we added the other L. And now the O. So we are just sending this back. We So this is the buffer, but it doesn't send us the whole buffer that it already has. It just sends us a buffer that we can fill. So this is this P is always empty to start with. And then we just add the characters one by one to it. So if we just execute the whole thing, let's have a look, go run, go. It actually outputs the hello world. So this is now a working program. In a real world scenario, this doesn't really make any sense because you wouldn't copy it character by character. You would copy the as much as you can, probably. So that's it for this lecture. We wrote our own streaming function. So this is how we implemented an interface and we're able to pass 
our variable which is a struct with a function within our struct so that we can pass this to read all and then read all will invoke this read function. So this pattern of interfaces actually comes back a lot in Golang and this is just a small example of how you can do this implementation but you will see in other examples that this is going to come back. Let's go back to our HTTP get JSON example. So this HTTP get JSON, this is my starting situation now. And let's try to add another endpoint that we are going to query. Here we assume that the endpoints will return words. But what if we hit another endpoint? So let's try it. Go run. So make sure that your HTTP test server is running just with go run in this test server directory. So we have another endpoint occurrence, which will show the occurrence of words. So if a word appears twice, it will just show two times. JSON cannot unmarshal object into go struct field words words of type string. Let's have a look with curl, or you can just put this in your browser. The words now here is not an array anymore. It's an object because let's maybe add some words so that it's clear. So we have the words input word one or word two, word two twice. So now we have two times word two. So here now the word two appears two times and this is now an object and not an array in this JavaScript object. So we would need to change this struct in a way that we can capture a map and an array. And we can do that easily to first parse the page. And only if the page is occurrence, we are going to parse the words as a map and not as an array. So how do we do that? Let's split this up. Type page. And let's move this page right here. Let's call it name. And then we're going to have our occurrences. Occurrence has no input, but it has words. And the word is a map with string as a key and an integer as a value. This is a string and this is an integer and we'll have multiple occurrences of these words within this JavaScript object. So we need to parse it as a map. So both these endpoints have the page attribute so we can first only parse the JSON partially using our page struct. Check the name. If the name of the page is words, then we parse it with a word struct. If the name is an occurrence, then we parse it with the occurrence struct. And then let's try to iterate over this map so that you know how to do that as well. So if the response code is 200, let's parse the page. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna call this page. The type is page, I'm gonna unmarshal page, also still the body. Then we're going to use the switch statement. The switch statement is going to do the same as our if, but only on one variable. So we can have conditionals based on this name. If the name is words, then we're going to execute something. If the name is occurrence, then we're going to execute a different block of code and we're going to have a default and a default is going to say page not found. If it's words, we can execute the same code. We just have to make sure that we also add case. In case page name is words, this needs to be executed. And in case page is occurrence, then we're going to unmarshal it a bit different. 
and also words page doesn't exist anymore we're just gonna call it page name so if the case is occurrence then we need to unmarshal the occurrence let's copy paste this and then let's replace words in occurrence and then we can have a look at our struct here we also have a word but now it's a map of key string int as value let's already try whether this works go run words so the json parsed page words and the words is two and two so we went through this and page name was equals to words so we executed this code occurrence okay no error here we have a 404 not found okay that that should be okay yeah so if you don't have a 200 then it's still 404 not found let's try to output this map how do we output the map then we can use a loop for a for loop for key value range because the map occurrence words so if we use this for statement then this will be our key and this will be our value key is a string value is an int so this is going to be our word and this is going to be the occurrence so let's try to output that string the then the integer and a new line and then we get word two two times let's try to add another word word three word four word one two times word one and then three and four now let's run the occurrence word one two times or two two times and three and four only once so this is how we loop over a map let me now execute it a few times now you can see that unlike an array a map is not ordered so if i execute it multiple times the order of the words will actually differ so this is an important difference between a map and an array in the array the order is always the same and here the order is not guaranteed it can actually differ let's say that you want to check whether an element exists how would you do that there's also a way to check whether an element in a map exists you can do that with an if statement so if and if you want to test for example if we have a word one as occurrence then if we have this if statement it will return two variables it will return the value and whether this occurrence exists so this is a boolean the boolean will be true if this element exists within the map and this will be the value the integer so if our words one exists we can test whether it actually exists so we can test is okay true is okay true then if it, if okay is true then i want to output the value font word one this is the output the value let's execute it again we found word one two times and now if it changes into a word that doesn't exist for example word five then it doesn't output it and this okay value will actually be false so this is a good way to test whether an element exists or not so to recap the most important that we did in this lecture is we are parsing our json partially we are only checking whether there is the name attribute within this json object the page name attribute if the page is present then we test whether it is words so we can then 
unmarshal based on the word struct and otherwise on the occurrence struct. If page name is empty, for example, when there was no JSON with the attribute page there, then we will hit the default because then page will be an empty string. So this way of parsing JSON is actually quite useful. You only parse a partial JSON, the element that you know that will always be there, or a specific element that you're looking for. And if this element is set, if this element is then words or occurrence, then based on that, you can then parse the rest of your JSON. And then in our example, we either have a string slice or a map. And depending whether we have the map or the slice, we need to process it differently. Otherwise, we will get an error, a JSON unmarshal error, like we've seen earlier. This approach will still only work if the output is JSON. So if we go and have a look here where we parse the page, this unmarshal will still give us an error if there is no JSON. So as long as your API returns JSON, we are safe. If it is not sending us JSON, this unmarshal will give us an error. So you might still want to have a look here. Capturing this error, you might want to handle what happens if the body was actually no JSON, because then you will still get an error. What error will you get? For example, if we do a go run on localhost, which is the main page, which is not JSON, then we get this invalid character looking for the beginning of the value. So it tries to parse the JSON, but it didn't work. So we still get an error. We will have another lecture on error handling, where I will cover some scenarios on how we can return different errors. In this demo, I'm going to start from HTTP get JSON map, exactly where we previously left with our words and occurrences. And instead of using one main function, I'm going to start splitting it up. So I'm going to create one function to do the request and then one main function that will be responsible to parse the argument and then call the request function, and if there's an error, print the error. So let's get started. I think this we are going to keep, but then here, this is going to be our new function. I'll call it just do request, and our function is taking one parameter, request URL, which is a string, and returning two variables. It's gonna be a response, and it's going to be an error. This response is not declared yet. We'll have to declare a response. Let's first fix the parameters here. So args one doesn't exist anymore. So I'm going to change it into request URL because it's the argument that I'll be passing here. And then we are going to do rest from response error equals do request and then args one we are going to pass. And if there's an error, then let's just output the error for now. We'll say there was an error. And then later we can still clean this up, but let's just return error for now. And then we have the response, but what is the response? So, the response can actually be either words or occurrence. Because we are handling two API calls, we have two different structs that we could potentially return. So what we could do is we could say, we are going to return words and occurrences. But that's not very nice because if we have, let's say, five API calls, then every time we'll have to change our return variables. Ideally, you don't really want to change your function signature every time that you add a feature or add another API call here. So we are going to choose something more generic, a response, and we will have to declare this response. And as in the earlier lecture that I showed you, I told you that interfaces are used a lot. So why don't we use an interface here? If we use an interface that, for example, has one function, get response, then 
our response interface here, our response, our res variable here, will have this function that we can call get response, and whether it's the words struct or the occurrence struct, we can have a different get response function for both of them. Let me show you how that would work, and it will become immediately clear. So response, we would have to declare this. Type response is going to be an interface. And I want a function that is called get response. We don't need to supply any arguments, but we're going to return a string. So now if we have this response here, then we can say if res equals to nil, then there was no response. But if res is not equal to nil, then we can say we're going to print the response and the response is get response. Makes sense. Now we can call the get response function because it's defined in the interface and res is of type response. Response is an interface which has the function get response. Now we still need to return a variable that has this function implemented. So if we have words, what would we like to return? We would just like to return words and we don't return an error. So we can just say nil. This is, we have response and error as return variables. So we say return words and nil. And here the same, return occurrence and then nil. This default we're gonna take away. If there's no hit, no return, because when we do a return, it will stop the function. So when we hit this here, I will say, no, there's no error really. It just, there's no response. Or I could say there is an error with no response. It kind of depends how you want to handle it. We are handling nil here as no response, but you could also say, oh, it's actually an error. There is no response. And then you would have to return an error here. Now, all the other occurrences where we have a log fatal error, we should return the error instead. So we cannot return any variable for a response. So we're just going to say nil, which is going to be empty. And then we're going to say empty error f. Unmar unmarshal error, so we know where it comes from, and the error. And this we can copy paste everywhere. Everywhere we have a log fatal, so these are the unmarshal errors. And here we can say there was an invalid output. So instead of fmt printf, we are using fmt error f, which will create an error instead of a string. Like this. And then here we have read all error, return nil, fmt error f, read all error, and the explanation. Could copy this here. This is a HTTP get error. And we're going to say here that just that the URL is not valid. Validation error. URL is not valid, and then the actual error. That looks like a good idea. So instead of exiting our program within our function, we're actually going to always return an, return an error. These ones. I think I have every, one, every error. Yeah. And what's going to happen then, if the error is not nil, we're going to print the error. In a later lecture, we can talk about error handling. Let's now try to skip that a little bit. So if there's an error, we're just going to print it and then exit. If still nothing was returned, but there was no error, there was no response. If our rest is not nil, then we have a get response. We do a get response. But where does this get response come from? 
we have a return words here and a return occurrences. Cannot use words as response value in return statement. Word does not implement response. Missing method get response. So we are saying that what we return here needs to implement the get response, but we haven't implemented get response yet. So let's try to do that. And also, if you find that the file is getting too long, you can just split it out in multiple files. So you could have a types.go or a words.go and occurrence.go where you put in those structs and those functions. But for now, I will keep it in one file. So words need to have the get response function. So I'm going to say func and then I'm going to add a function to this struct get response and we return string and then we need to return an actual string we have this slice here so i'm just going to say f fmt s print f so you have print f which is prints on screen and s print f which just returns a string and then you have error f which is an returning an error i can then still format my output and i'm just going to say just like we did previously, join w words, w is here, and then here we can access our struct. And I'm gonna go for something comma separated. I'm going to do the same with occurrence. func o occurrence, I just take small cap of the name. This is not a array, so I just need to Transform it a little bit. Let's let's try to get this in the same format. So I'm going to say out equals new string slice for key value of our occurrence words. Out equals append out. So what is happening here? We're going to append to our slice. The append built-in function appends an element to the end of a slice. So here are some example append slice element one, element two, or or you can even merge a slice. So if you just add one element, you can just do it. Just add a parameter. If it's another slice or multiple elements, you need to add three dots so that these can be merged together. And then the result is then assigned to a new slice or to the same slice here. So out equals append out, and then we're going to add a string fmt as in print f. I'm gonna say my word and then the occurrence. Kv, or I should call it really word and occurrence. And use that. It's always nicer in Golang to use the actual name of a variable rather than just one letter. We get an error. Expected boolean or range expression. Okay, so we need to add a range here, otherwise we will not have the key value. So this is out, and then I'm going to join the out slice, string join, and then we'll have returned a string, a join string. I'm going to add a new line here. So we have the words, we have the occurrence. We return the words, we return the occurrence. Now we don't have an error anymore because we implement this interface. So let's have a look whether this actually works. Go run words. Connection refused. That means that our server is not running. Let me just start the server on another screen. Now it is running, no response. Maybe I should give an input, word one, word two, word two. Okay, that works. Occurrence, that also works. So now we have written a function, do request, that gives us back a response with a function get response or an error. 
and then here in our main the only thing that we do is we check for the arguments and then we do the request based on the argument and if there's an error we're gonna print it so if we just hit our main endpoint our index then we get the error so error and martial error so now we can actually see where it comes from that was an unmartial error you can even specify what unmartial error it was to make it more clear what error was triggered so this is how we can use functions in golang now what i would explain next in one of the next lectures is then how you do error handling how can we handle different errors that's also going to be interesting because now we have an, another function but this error is pretty generic how would we be able to handle multiple errors also like i said these interfaces are pretty commonly used in golang they are pretty powerful when you are returning different types instead of specifying multiple types in your return statement you would rather implement an interface let's talk about error handling so the start situation is HTTP get functions because we just implemented functions and like I said earlier in the previous lecture we do a request but then if there's any error we just say here's the error message but there's not much information wouldn't it be nicer that if we already did a request and we have an HTTP status code and a body to also return that in case we have it so then we can actually write our own error handling our own custom error handling with our own custom error type so what is this error actually can we can we figure this out so in built-in there's the error defined the error is just an interface as long as we implement error string we can pass our own variables as an error we just need to make sure that we implement this function let's try to do that and let's then store some extra information our file becomes a bit bigger so i'm going to write this in error.go still package main and what you use as a name doesn't really matter i use error but you can use as well another name it doesn't really matter for golang so let's write our own custom error type and we will call it request error because it, if you have a request error then we can supply some more information it's a struct and it's going to have an http code which is an integer maybe a body which is a string and an error string and then we still need to implement the error function so that we will be able to pass it where the error interface is used and it was error error string because it is returning a string and we will just be the returning the error which is of type string that should be it now we can return our custom request error where are we going to do that well once we did the request so if it's not 200 we we already know and we return the body so you could already change it here but really where it matters for us now is starting from here what if we get an unmartial error we don't really know what was returned so if we change this into our request error and this will still work for the type error because we implement the function error and request error we expose these three fields so we can fill out those fields hp code is going to be the response status code the body is going to be string body and the error is still going to be the error but we can still specify it's an unmartial error but now we have to do sprintf because it's string unmartial error and then the actual text 
and a comma. This should work. And we can copy paste this here. And we can copy paste this here. You can say occurrences and martial error. So we still know where exactly this happened. Words and martial error. And page and martial error. Save this. But now we also need to check here our error. Well, let's first run it without changing anything. Let's see what happens. Occurrence, but we don't we don't have any words. We don't have any words. Let me input one word. Okay, words. And let's now trigger an error. Nothing changed because like I said, the error will still be printed. And the extra information is just not available because we're not using it. So how do we start using it? Well, we can test whether our error is of a specific type. So is our error of a specific type? We can try to change it to a different type. And if that is possible, then we can print some more information. So how do you in Golang change a variable to a different type? So we can say error. Error is of type error, but we want it to be of type request error. This will return two variables, the request error, the variable of the new type and whether it worked. Let's see what this is. Let's see. Okay, so this is a Boolean. If the Boolean is okay, if the changing of the error type to request error, if that works, then okay will be true. And then request error will be a request error and not of type error anymore. Once we have type request error, what we can do is we can output some more information. We can say HTTP code was this, body was this. And then we can say request error. So the first argument can be request error, the error itself, then request error HTTP code, and then request error body. We save this. Let's run our program again. Error, page on Marshall error, invalid character T, looking for the beginning of value. But the HP code was 200 and the body is the server is running. Let's have a look. Indeed, error code 200, the server is running. And what happened here is we try to unmarshal this as a JSON, but the first letter is a T and not a curly bracket. So that's why we were looking at the beginning of the value of a JSON, but we didn't get a JSON. So this error is a bit not very nice for end users. So if you want, what you can do is if JSON valid body, or if it's not valid, then we can return our request error and we can say json no valid json returned we save this try to execute it again no valid json returned hp code 200 the, bo the body is the server is running so now we see the hp error code the body and that there was no valid JSON. So that makes it already a little bit more user friendly because if we're going to hit one of these errors now, we can already see what the returned body was. So again, these interfaces are pretty important. If you want to customize your errors, you are also using the error interface and to then make your own custom error, you just have to make sure that you implement this error function. So it matches with the interface and then within the struct you can have whatever fields you want 
and you can populate whatever fields you want. In this demo, I'm going to refactor our arguments a little bit to use the flag package. The starting position is our HP get error handling, and we're going to build the HP get flags. So we are using OS arcs to get the command line arguments, but then we have to parse them ourselves, which is not ideal, especially when Golang has a flag package for it. So we can just add to the import a flag package, and that should be able to handle the flags that we're going to add, the arguments. I'm going to make this change because in the next lecture I want to add another argument. So I want to add another flag that we can not only specify a URL but also a password because we're going to make our endpoint password protected. So we need to be able to pass a password and still the URL. So how does this package work? I'm going to define some variables. You can define variables also with those round brackets. And then you can just say request URL is a string. I'm also going to ask for a password, which we are not going to use yet. And then we can use a flag package. So we are going to say flag dot string var var so you can use string or string var and the string var accepts a string string pointer so we need to reference this variable the name the value the default value the usage for the help and then we can parse the flags so request url is going to be the first one it's called the url default value is going to be empty and what else do we need do we need something else? So I'm going to save this so that the flag is imported. And the usage. So default. Oh, actually, I need string var. That's why I was missing one argument here. So this is a default. And this is the usage URL to URL to access. And then this request URL will then pass to our request. So we need something very important still, flag.parse, and this will parse our flags. We are going to do the same for password. So I'm going to say password is a password that we're going to supply. Use a password to access our API. We are not going to use this yet, but I just already want to have it in place for our next lecture. This we can then move to our main function. This doesn't really belong here. We are going to check the variables before we pass them to the function. If this works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this parsed URL because I will need this one later. Parsed URL equals and then I have parsed URL of type URL URL. Still get this error here. Let's, let's change this in a printf and OS exit one. And then here, instead of request URL, I'm just going to use the parsed URL. There's not really a difference, but later on I want to use this parsed URL. So I want to stop using this request URL. I want to have this parsed URL. Remember, if I have this parsed URL declared like this, then it's only going to be accessible within this conditional. So I need to remove this equal sign and I'm just going to define them here. So parse, U, parse URL returns a URL. Here's a pointer. Don't really have to think about it too much. It returns a pointer, but we can use it in the same way. And then our error. And then parse URL is not used. So let's use it. Let's just reply the string of the parse URL. String reassembles the URL into a valid URL string. So basically we parsed it using this parse request URI and then the parsed URL we're gonna send to the do request. And when we're going to have more functions then we will be able to send only the host name or only the scheme for example. So let's have a look how this works. 
I'm gonna save this. So this was how I was accessing it earlier. The URL is not valid. The URL is not valid because I didn't pass the correct parameter now. Now we have to pass it differently. So let me give a hint here. Maybe let's do this. URL is not valid. Usage HTTP get minus H just to show the end user that minus H will give you the usage. So minus H or there's even a better way actually to do it. So let me just show for you first minus H minus H then shows the usage. But then now that I think of it, there is also a way to print the usage flag usage print the usage I don't even think you need the printf let's see yeah this makes more sense validation error URL is not valid and then the usage so that we know if we cannot parse the URL there's something wrong we didn't supply a URL for example so then it shows the usage. So the usage is that you have to pass a dash URL and then the URL. So that makes sense. No valid JSON returned. But if you do rewards, words input test, then it all should work. Yes, it all works. So this is a nicer way of passing variables with the built-in flag function. So in these lectures, I'm always using built-in functions so that you don't have to depend on external libraries, external packages. But there's actually a very good external package available, github.com, spf13, Cobra. Cobra is one of these replacements for flag that you can use, which has a very nice way of passing arguments. Other command line utilities already use this Cobra. So if you're going to parse a lot of parameters, it's definitely worth to have a look at this package. And there are definitely also other packages around that can help you parse flags. This flag package, it actually does the job for very simple arguments if you just need to capture some strings. But for example, there's no way to make a string mandatory except to, for example, parse it here like I do, because there's no way to say this parameter is optional or this parameter is re required at this time and I don't think they would actually implement this in the built-in package because they tend to keep it very bare bone, very stable. So if you are going to work with optional and mandatory parameters, have a look at these other packages. So that's it for this lecture and in the next lecture we will have a look at authentication and that's why we need this password. For this next program that I'm going to create, let me just go over a diagram to show you what the flow is going to be. This is what we did right now. We have the HP get client, we get the words, and the return is a JSON from the test server. And then we just parse the JSON. We can enable authentication on the test server on the right here. We can say there needs to be a password set. If we start a test server with a password value as a parameter, then we'll actually need authentication. And to be able to do authentication, you will need to provide a JWT. That's a token, a JSON web token. It's a token that is used a lot as a temporary token once you are authenticated. So we first need to authenticate and then we'll get the token and then we will be able to access the test server endpoints again. So how does this authentication flow work? And it's very similar to other authentication workflows that you will see in real world scenarios. That's why I chose this JWT workflow because it's pretty common to do something like that. So our password is XYZ and our HTTP client needs to first log in with this password before it will get a token. We do a post on login with password XYZ. So we send our password to the server and then the server will send us back a JWT, this token, 
And this token we can then use instead of sending our password with every request, we will send this token. So this token, if you would read it, it's a JSON and it has a certain expiry. I think we are working here with an expiry of one hour. So every one hour we would need to get a new token. Once we have a token, we can then access our endpoints. So for example, we can get the words with the authorization header. It's a bearer token and then our JWT. This bearer is just a keyword that is often used. You can even remove this keyword. It should still work because our server will remove this bearer token before parsing the JWT, but it's not a requirement. And then the test server, instead of giving back a forbidden error, it will give back the JSON. So that's how it works. That's how the flow works. Now we just need to try and program this in our HTTP GET client to first do a POST request if there's a password supplied, get this token, and then make sure that every call to the API includes then this HTTP header, and then we should get back the words. Our starting point is the HTTP flag program, and from here we will then implement the POST request. So if the password is not empty, password is not equals to empty, then we have something in it. And we should first do a POST request on the login API. How do we do a POST request? Well, we would have to write that first. Let's do, do POST request or do login request. It's going to be a login request. And we are going to get back a token and that token we will need to use to send as a header when doing the do request API call. Do login request and we also need to supply the password. And instead of the full parsed URL, we are going to send a schema, which is HTTP or HTTPS, depending what is supplied. And then the host name, parsed URL, host, and then actually the endpoint is going to be login. So we're just going to supply the whole endpoint. Do login requests, and let's put this then in a separate file, new file, login.go, package main, going to do our login request um, and we have request URL, login URL, string and then we have what is our second parameter password is also string and we're going to re reply a string which is our token and an error. So this if you have two times string you can actually remove this this string because then it says login URL and password are both string. I will just put a placeholder. We're gonna fill this out right away. And here I have a token and an error. So for the error, I could just copy paste this probably. It's not 100% nice. We could put this in another function probably, but for now it will do. And then let's print this token for now. Token. And let's just exit for now. For now, just to see if it works. Token. Do login request. So now we need to see what this API will give us. So if we, in a second window, open the test server, Let's try to run our test server and test this out. So this is our test server. And then if you just go to words, we did a get on words, but our password was empty. Password XYZ token is empty. Okay, so we made a request, but it didn't go through yet because we still because we still need to write because we still need to write the post request and here we also need to supply the password password xyz 
and then it will start on port 8080 and then it will enforce the words so here authorization header not set because we have now a password here and we need to then make sure that we first do the post request get a token so let's get started with it let's have a look at this may not go they there is actually the login request and login response that I can reuse. So the login, so the login request and login response is going to be the same for me. What we need to do now is to make a post request to the login endpoint. So here we have the login URL. So we need to do a post request on that URL and we need to pass the password using this login request struct. This password needs to be wrapped in JSON. So the first step would be to generate this JSON. And then the second step would be to do the post request with this JSON. So let's make a new variable login request. Login request equals the type login request. And we're immediately going to fill it out. The fields that are in it, password, is password so this password comes from here and this password is the field name this is the login request the type and this is the new variable name i have chosen so typically you would choose the same variable name as the type just starting with lowercase that's what i typically do then we need to marshal it so we can what we did earlier was to unmarshal a json into a struct now we have a struct we need to marshal it into a json and it will then be exported as bytes as a byte array json marshal any type our type is a login request and it outputs byte and error so we're going to say this is my body that i want to pass error if there is an error then i will return it I'll just return empty string because we don't have a token. Unmarshal error. Marshal error. And then the error. Then we need to use the body in our HTTP post. We did HTTP get, now we'll do HTTP post. HTTP post, first the URL, then the content type, and then the body. Request URL is our URL. Or login URL, what is it? Login URL. I'll just call it request URL. Then it's the same as the other function. Request URL. The content type. Content type should be application JSON. It's the HTTP content type. And then the body of IO reader. So we can not just pass body because this is an array of bytes. Cannot use body variable of type byte as reader, missing method read. So we are missing again this method read, but they are functions that we can use in Golang to convert our byte array into a variable that implements this read function. And there's in the bytes package, a function new buffer new buffer from a string or new buffer from a byte array byte is undeclared i'm just going to save this so that byte is imported and then we pass this body now bytes new buffer outputs a bytes buffer and let's just have a look at this at this definition bytes buffer is a buffer and it will implement somewhere here it will implement the read function so we see these are the functions implemented for buffer truncate reset and there should be the read function as well here and this is the function that we implemented earlier you see they're also using the copy function but they just try to read as much as possible from our bytes that we would pass So that's it for the buffer. Now we have something that supports the read function. Post 
returns a response and an error. Response and error. And then from here, we can actually copy paste from our do request because it's going to be the same. So you have the response and error, do or read all, status code, unmarshal. Let's copy all this. You can then change it a little bit. And we're already using body here. I'll just call this Russ. If there's an error, we say an HB post error. Read all. Let's save it. Okay. Uh, we don't have errors here, and this is imported. Then we have Russ. If it's not 200, import HP code, we can do that. Response. This is the response. This is actually the response body. I'll just call it response body, rest body. And then if our response body is not valid, the JSON, we can return an error if you want. And then instead of page, we're going to use this login response. Our login response, that's what the login endpoint will reply. We unmarshal the login response, and instead of nil, we are replying an empty string. And if that all goes right, then we should have login response token that we should reply. So that last return replies a token and a nil because there's no error. And in any other case, we are just returning the error. Let's save this. Let's go. If password is not equals to empty, then we hit M and the endpoint, and then we're going to print the token. All right, let's try to test that. Let's run our test server. Allow. Let's try without password. Yeah, authorization header not set. Let's try with a password, and then it should hit this code right here. Password XYZ, token is empty, token is empty. So let's have a look what is happening. We hit the login endpoint, we did a post, this is already correct. We passed our login request, application JSON. So this is all correct, but is our body correct? Let's just add another statement. If login response token is empty, let's then also return error and also return the body. Empty error. Right, I don't need printf. Empty token replied. Save this, and then we should go here, and then it should show us what our output is. Empty token replied, body, password, XYZ. Oh, this is our body. It's not the response body. <laughs> um, rest body, I didn't replace this. Let's re replace it everywhere. Response body, response body. Response body. Oh, the token was replied, but our token is empty. That means I'm doing something wrong. And here I'm using body instead of response body. So basically, I am unmarshalling my login request instead of unmarshalling my response body. It's because they have the same type. It's a bit annoying. If they wouldn't have the same type, then it would be more easily visible. But we have this extra check, so that's easy then to debug. Save this, run it again. This is our token.
back to main. So let's now remove those two lines. And then we need to pass this token to our do request. Whenever we do a request, right here, we need to also supply a header, an HTTP header authorization, and we need to pass this token. You could actually, every time you do an HTTP request, every time you call get, supply this token, and every time you have a do request, because you could have more functions for do request, you would have to remember that you also have to, you have to send this token. Or there's another method, instead of always supplying it when doing HTTP GET, you can also pass an HTTP client to every function and make sure that when any function uses this HTTP client, it automatically will send your headers that you need to your endpoint. So there's a subtle difference here. Instead of changing this function, we could actually also supply a variable that will replace this HTTP variable that then will be our client. Let's have a look at this HTTP GET. HTTP GET does a GET of the default client. The default client. And the default client is a client, an HTTP client. So this client we could also supply with our HTTP GET method and then it would not, not use this default client, but our client. And when we use our own HTTP client, we can pass parameters. So the benefit is that this code stays the same, very transparent. You just write HTTP GET, HTTP POST, any, anything that you want. But with our own client, with our own HTTP client, we can then make sure that our own HTTP client has the information that we need, has the headers that we want to pass in a separate part of our code and that's why we define our headers. So that's much nicer to program it that way because then we have it nicely separated. We have the HP call, the HP lo logic to do the get request, but we have the logic that we need for the token somewhere else. So how do we do that? We first need to pass this HP client. So we can say client is HP client, and then we say client.get. And client.get is in this client get function. So this is the default client that is now our own HTTP client. So the difference is quite subtle. So if you do HTTP get, we actually are, end up using a different function than client get. Client get is basically the same as default client get. Whereas default client is the default client that is defined in this package and here we are not using the default client, we are using our own HTTP client. So that just leaves us defining our HTTP client. We can say here client equals HTTP client. And what we can do is we can use for transparency the same client here, do login, do login request. So whenever we do a request, we are going to pass a client. So we're not going to use a default client anymore. And then here we also need to say client is an HTTP client. HTTP.client. And instead of HTTP, we use client. So now we are using our own client here, here and here. And we don't have a token to pass in our first do login request. So once we have the token, what we are going to do then is we are going to say client.transport. We are going to define a transport a variable here. Transport specifies the mechanism by which HP individual HP requests are made. If nil, which is the default, the default transport is used. So the default transport will be used if you don't define this. But we can define our own transport method. And in our transport method, we can define how HTTP requests are made. We can say then, when we make an HTTP request, we need to also supply our token as an HTTP header. So this needs to be, this transport needs to be of HTTP round tripper. We don't have it yet. 
So let's make a new struct in transport.go, still package main, and let's define this HP round stripper. So we're gonna call this my JDLT transport, my JDLT transport, and then we need to define the struct type my GLT transport struct and we're gonna have a token field for our token so that's we can we can pass our token here token is token and what do we get cannot use JLT transport literal as HP round tripper a, we are not the implementing HP round tripper missing method round trip so this HP round tripper is gonna be another interface that expects us to implement the method round trip so we'll have to implement round round trip my jlt transport function we're going to implement round trip but what is a signature we would have to look that up let's have a look at this transport so in the client we have transport is of type round tripper round tripper is an interface and it is round trip request and response round trip request and we just have to add HTTP because now we are outside the package HTTP request and HTTP response we're gonna give it a variable name curly brackets and then we basically have to rewrite the round trip method but I'm not very keen on rewriting the whole function I just want to add another header to it to the request and then I want that we are using the default round tripper rather than writing my own round trip. So I'm gonna add a header, but then I want to use the default round trip. So how do I do that? Let's have a look here in the transport method again. So we have the client transport, go to definition. Transport specifies the mechanism by which individual HP requests are made. If nil, default transport is used. This default transport, this is the one I wanna use. Um, I think I can just go to the definition. Okay, this is a default transport. So the default transport is a round tripper. And this is the transport that I want to use because this is the default implementation. So how do I do that? I'm going to define another variable. I want to define a transport variable. And I want to have it of this HTTP round tripper interface. HTTP round tripper interface. That means that I'll be able to pass this default transport in my main function, which is of type round tripper. And then this transport implements this round trip function. And then I will be using the default transporter. So that's quite some information there transport default transport http default transport because it's in the package so this hp default transport is of type hp round tripper let's have a look it's of hp round tripper and it is using this variable transport this is transport and this transport will then implement as well the round trip function so let me just look for this round trip function. Here's the round trip function, the request response. And you see it's a whole logic that does the implementation to do a round trip. So if I pass in my main.go the default transport of type round tripper, then here I can use m transport round trip r or let me, let me call it rec from request and then i can return this return m transport round trip m transport refers to here which is my hp default transport and this will be executed and then returned so now even though i implemented my jvd transport it is still not doing anything it's just using the default is still using this default transport method, which would be implemented anyways if our transport was nil. So transport 
if it's nil default transport is used. So the only thing that we did is we are using our own struct here, my JLD transport, but we are passing the tra default transport here. And then we are saying our struct is implementing this round trip, but actually we are just calling this default transport and we are calling this round trip function. So that it executes a single transaction for us. What we then still want to do though, is we want to inject this header. We have the request, the request has a an header and the header has a add function. We're going to add the authorization and authorization is going to have bear, a bear token and token. And what we can also do is we can say only do this if M token is not equal to, is not empty, then add please this bear token in the authorization error, then do the normal round trip that you would normally do. So then we set the client transport and then we pass the client. And we're also using this client here, but we only set the transport afterwards. So here there's nothing gonna happen even though if you would define the transport higher, as long as we don't have a token set, it will not do anything. It will not deviate from the standard behavior. So we have a non-empty password. We change our way of transporting and then we pass the client. And here we don't change any code. So that's now very nicely done, I find, that we don't have to change any code, but it will still pass our JLT. Let's try, go run URL, password. It should first hit the login endpoint and then we are going to set it to transport, which will be my JLT transport. I'm gonna add this header, bear, there needs to be a space here as well. And then we're gonna do the request. Do the request. We will do this get request here. This will pass the authorization header and then it should just reply words because we are passing the token. And we hit the words endpoint with our bear token. Let's give it an input. Input word one, response word one. So you see, every time we execute this, we hit the login endpoint, we get a token and we send this token. Now, in reality, we only need to get this token once until the token expires. So when we execute it twice, we don't really have to hit this endpoint, this login endpoint. We could just use the token that we already got. And that's, and that's how it works in real world scenarios as well. If we would do multiple requests, we only would hit the login endpoint once, we get a token, and as long as the token is valid, then we're going to hit these other endpoints, these get endpoints. We could save the token somewhere in a file or in a database, and then before we do this get request, we could check whether our, our JLT is valid. And there are a lot of JLT functions that you can check out. Um, it's a little bit out of scope of this demo, this lecture that I'm doing now. So I'm not gonna explain it now, but you could already have a look in the main function of this server, main.go. Here we are using Golang JLT, JLT v4, and we do a parse at some point. So when we, we have uh, authentication middleware in in our server where we check whether the authorization token is valid and we use this JLT parse for that. So there are JLT functions in external dependencies within Golang that you can use to parse, to create uh, those JLT tokens. And when we created our token, when we create our token in the login, so this is This here is our login function. So in our login function, we actually create the JLT, JLT new with claims. 
and we make it valid as an expiry of one hour. So this JLT we could use for one hour on this server and we wouldn't have to authenticate. We wouldn't have to hit this login endpoint every time. And then what we could do here is we could check whether our token is still valid. If our token is empty or not valid, we could then hit this login endpoint to get a new token. That's a typical implementation. That's how you could do an implementation to completely make your get requests transparent to basically move all the logic here. And that's how you would also see in other external packages that you're going to use. That's also how it is typically implemented. So that's it for this lecture. You see again that interfaces are broadly used in, in Golang and that creating your own function with some extra logic here and then calling the default, the default function is an approach that is often used within Golang to override some of the default behavior. This lecture, I'm going to move our code to a separate package. So we have the package main that we have been using and we have been importing different Go packages. But instead of having all the code in our main package, I'm going to create another package where we're going to move all our code to and we're going to call this new package from our main package. That means we will not have a lot of logic anymore in our main function. And that's how it should be. We should keep the code in the main function to a bare minimum and move everything to reusable packages. So we are starting from the HTTP login code base and now we're going to move this to a separate package. So I'm still in this hello world directory which is my working directory and I have these files here arrow go login main transport and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a directory structure. I'm going to remove this binary main which was created by a go build and I'm going to create a directory, which you can do here with mk dir or just new folder here. I'm going to create cmd. cmd and then in cmd I'm going to have my binary and my main.go HTTP login packaged, I'm going to call it. And then I will have a directory where I'm going to put my package, pkg, I'll call it pkg API. So we have our cmd login packaged, the main.go goes in there, and all the other, the other files go in here. The error login and transport go into the package API. Then we just need to make sure that we put a complete URL in the go mod. So typically what you put as a module is the URL because your URL will be unique. So my unique URL will be kitab.com wardviana colang for DevOps course HP login packaged. So this is where I will push this code. So I'm going to use that. Go 1.18 or any other Go version that you are using. I'm going to save this. And this is now what we're going to import in our main.go. I'm going to close these just to make sure that I open the correct files. So main.go. First of all, I will take these types and we're going to move them. So I'm going to make a new file get.go. This is now going to be package API. So I need to also change this in the other files package API. Package API and package API. And then I'm going to take my main.go, move some of these things out of here into the get.go because we only want the main, the main, we parse the URLs and then do the requests and do request can also go in our package. Here we go. And then the main not go. And what we then want to do is we want to initialize this package. You can do it in different ways. First of all, you will need to import it. So it will need to be imported here. GitHub.com and then pkg api is going to be our api 
Now, if I save this, we are not using it anywhere. So Visual Studio Code will remove it. So we will have to use it somewhere before we save. Right here, for example, where we do an API dot, and then we can use some of these exported variables or functions. So you see only the one that starts with a capital letter will be exported. The variables or functions that, that don't start with a capital letter will not be exported, are not accessible, which is the same as private and public if you are familiar with Java or other languages that use the private and public keywords. Here, whether a function or a variable is exposed outside the package is whether it has a capital first letter or a lowercase. Now, there are multiple ways to use a package. One of my favorite ways to do it is to use a new function. And when we use this new function, then we can return an interface with the correct functions. Now, there are different ways. You could also call them directly, the functions. But with this new keyword that you then return the interface, it actually helps you later on if you want to do testing. So when we want to write tests, this is going to help us. So that's why I'm going to use this approach. API new. So in API, I will create an init.go or you can call it whatever you want, where it's still going to be package API, package API, where I'm going to write this new function. And this new function will then return an interface. It's going to be my API interface. And I will add the word I face interface just so that I can recognize it in my own code. I like to be able to recognize interfaces by name. But you are free to do whatever you want. So because it starts with because it starts with letter A, it will be exposed. Type API interface is an interface. And then I will return this, and this will have my functions that I can then use in my main.go. But then I need to return a variable that implements these API interfaces. So I'll write my type API of type struct. And here again, you can choose whether you're going to use lowercase or uppercase. If you use uppercase, then you can initialize this variable from outside the package. If I use uppercase, like this API or API, then someone can initialize this variable directly. Again, it depends what you want. I often do it with the uppercase so that if someone wants to access it directly because it wants to circumvent the, the new, then it's possible. But if you really want, maybe for yourself, have a package that you only can initialize using the new function, you should use lowercase. But I'm going to use uppercase for now because that's what I typically do. Some people say also that if you write a package and you don't expose them, it can be a bit harder. If you want to implement something customized and then you have to make a copy of the library and then make some changes to it. So in general, uppercase and exporting is a good idea. API struct and what do I need to pass? Well, I'm going to need the password. I'm going to need the login URL. And I'm also going to need the HTTP client. So to make it easy, I'm going to make another type, the options type. It's going to be a struct. I'm going to have two options, password, which is a string, and the login URL is also a string because I need to know this login URL in the end in my package so that I know where to log in. Then my API accepts options, which is of type options, and then the client is going to be the HTTP client. I might change it later to an interface when we are going to do the testing, but I will leave it for now here so that I can keep the explanation for later. So if you're going to do a new, I'm going to ask the options and then I'm going to return a new API. This new API, well, I'll have to pass the options. So the options, this is what I need to pass in the main function. And also I will have to initialize my HTTP client. So I'll say my client is of HTTP client. And this HTTP client will also have transport. Remember, we need this special, we need this MyJLT transport here. 
And then immediately what I want to do is I want to pass the transport. And I also want to pass the password and login URL because we will need that. So transport is going to be HTTP default transport. What I want to do is I want to move within this transport code also this code. So if password is not equals to empty, then I want to do then I want to do this login request. So I want to move this information that I need, these two parameters, so that this bit can also go out of the main function. I don't want to have any logic whatsoever in this main function except just parsing my parameters and then executing my, my request. So password, but then let's also change it here. I'm going to ask for a password, which is a string, and a login URL, which is also a string. Save this, and then the password is the options.password, and the, the login URL is the options login URL. So now I have all the information being passed to my transport. So let's try to work on this first, so that this code can go away. Let's go to transport, and then I want to add some code here. So if the token is empty, and the password is not empty, then I want to get this token. And if I get an error, I want to return an error. I don't want to exit the program, I just want to return an error, and then it will be captured in the main function. It will be captured here. So I'm going to say if error, if error is not equal to nil, return nil, and then the error. And if I have a token, then I'm going to say I'm token equals token. Oh, and then password should be m password because we supplied it here. Here we supply the password. So when we then don't have a token, but I have, we have a password, then we're going to do the login request, and then we're going to add a header if we have a token. But we only want to execute this when we do a get request or we, when we do the when we do the do request here. So let's not pass this client here to do a login request. Let's pass a new client just so that we are not sending our own client with with transport because that would be a bit weird. Just in case that we would do. A login request and then we would do another login request because we would be in a loop then so just to make sure that we're not going to make any loops let's do another client and then the, this, the login information is now going to be from the login url and the password is going to be also supplied when we initiated this function so then we are good here i think so let's go back to the main.go Let's try to write our API new because then I can show you the, the whole flow. We have an API instance, api.new, API options. This is our options right here. So we can supply a password and the login URL. Password is our password. Login URL is going to be our login URL that we just removed but I still copy pasted it from my previous project so it is right here the parsed URL scheme parsed URL host and the login so now we have API instance and now I can do requests using this API instance API instance declared but not used and it's of API interface so let's build this interface so that we can do a call of this do request so this do request now needs to be part of this API. So this API struct is what we return here. We return this API here. So this API needs to get the function. Needs to get the function do request. So we can say a API is now do request. I will call it do get request. Just to make it more clear. We don't need the client anymore because the client is now in this API. 
we have this API here. We have the HTTP client here that we can refer to. A API do request, we don't need the client, but we still would need the request URL. And then this then becomes a.client.get because our client is now our HTTP client within this struct. This is our function signature that we want to expose. I'm going to my API interface that we return here. My API interface is now do get request. This is not going to work because it's lowercase, so it's not exposed. So I'm going to expose it by making it an uppercase. I'm going to save this. I'm going to save this and this. And then now I should be able to change this code, do request. So API interface, I pass the API options, I get a new API interface. API interface has a do request. I return here my API, which implements this do request. Right here, API do request, do get request. So I should be able to do the get request. The client I don't need anymore because now we initialize here the client. We could still let the user supply the client if you want, but we are not. We're just defining it so it's easier. Client is the HTTP client and the transport is my JLT transport. And that's why we need to pass this information to my JLT transport as well. API instance, API instance dot do get request. Then we don't need the client anymore because we initiate it in the new function. And then this still gives us an error because we move this to the API package. I'll save this. Do we still have errors? I don't think so. So we did the new, this replies the API interface. The API interface has one function, do get request. Do get request gets executed. It uses the A client, which is here. This is the client that we defined with the transport. The transport is here. Transport will be initialized. Token will be empty, but the password will be set. We do the login request with a separate client so we don't execute this round trip code twice with the login URL, with the password. And then if the token is not empty, so if we retrieved here the token, then we can add the authorization header and we execute the round trip code of the default transport. If we get an error somewhere here, then we will return the error. If we return the error, then the connection will stop and it will display the error. So this looks all pretty good. So what do we have left in our main function? So here we import a package. We ask the arguments that we want. We parse them. We check whether it's a URL. If it is a URL, we, we pass the options. Password can still be empty. Login URL could still be unused if we don't have a password protected API. Then we have the API instance. API instance here. We do a get request because this is the interface. And then we check whether it's of API request error because then we can show a better error code. If we have a result, we're going to print result. So we don't have much code left in our main. The idea is to have as less code as possible in our main function. We can still have some parsing of the parameters and some error handling, but that should really be it. And even if you want, we can move this to a separate package if we think this is going to be reusable. And then we only have basically one line in our main.go. Let's try to execute it now. The test server, go run, go, password, ABC. And then now we cannot do go run, go anymore because there's no go file anymore. It's in the CMD directory in the CMD HP login packaged. So now we can actually also have multiple commands if you want. You just have to make another directory and we can have multiple main packages if you would have multiple executables. Go run cmd hp login packaged main.go minus h. It still works. URL localhost 8080 words password abc and that works. Input equals xyz. We have a word xyz and you see 
here's our first post request, here's our second post request. So the post request is actually working. If you want to do a get request, then our round trip gets executed. We'll do the login request and here and here in the main, we actually do the get request. So for the developer that didn't write this package, it only sees this new function. And if we wanted, we could make all the other ones invisible so that it's very clear what functions we can use. And that was what I was saying. If we export this API, we will still see this API. And we can define this API. We can say new API equals API API. And then we can pass these options and client ourselves if we wanted. So if you want, for example, to override this client ourselves, we could do that. But if we would make it lowercase in init.go, let's make it lowercase API. And now it says undeclared. And now it still says we are missing the do get request because we need to also make this lowercase then API dot, we don't see the API anymore. We see API interface. So now we can only get the API interface. We only, the only function that we see is a new function. And we can still even make these login requests and this login response lowercase so that we don't see them appearing when we are checking this API. It can still make sense, for example, the request error to have this one exposed because we might want to use it right here to do our own error parsing. With other ones, we could make them unexported so that we don't see them. It all depends on how do you want to make this package. Like I said, sometimes it might be useful to export your API just in case that you want to pass your own variables like the HTTP client. So that's it. You also see that we use this different directory structure. This is kind of what I like to use, but it's all up to you in the end, what kind of directory structure that you might want to use. This one with CMD, you will often see in other projects as well. And this PKG, you can also often see. There's no real rule. You are free to use what you like. So what is next, I would say, is we need to write some tests for our package. So typically, you would have minimal tests for your main function, but you have much evolved tests for your packages because these are reusable and you want to make sure that these work as intended. After I published these lectures about the transport, a student that enrolled in this course made me aware that there's actually a mistake in this transport.go that needs correction. So because we are invoking this HTTP login, only once per execution, so we execute it, and then we only do one API call, we always do the login request. But what if we would do two API calls? Then this if m token equals to nothing should work because we are setting the m token to the token if we do the login request. And actually it doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't, and I can show it to you in a second, is because I wanted to keep it simple by not using pointers. So we are not using a pointer here to the struct. We are not passing it as a pointer, which means we can change these variables. But because we are not passing it as a pointer, it will not save it in the next call. So let me just show you how that works in practice. If I just take this do request here, and I'm just going to do it twice. So I'm going to do two requests on the words API. Then we see post on login, then the words, and then another post on login, which shouldn't happen if we store our token. And that's because we are not passing this struct in the init.go as a pointer. So transport, when we do a new, we should pass this my JLT transport as a reference here. This is still the HP round tripper. I'm going to save this. And here, this function is going to be a pointer. So now if I change this token, I change this token in my struct, it's going to be still available the next call. Because otherwise, I will always have a copy 
of this struct. So the next call is still going to have an empty token. It's going to be initialized again. It's going to be a new my JWT transport instead of the same one. So let's try it out now. And now I have the post login and two times I'm hitting the slash words endpoint because now I'm saving this M token and the next call we are still using the same my JLT transport because now we are sending it as a pointer, not just as a copy and I can make changes. So I try to avoid using pointers, not to have to explain your pointers because I'm explaining them later, but here it was actually necessary to introduce pointers already because we are making a change to a variable in a struct. And if you are making a change and we want to keep the change, we have to use a pointer here. We have to make sure that we are working with a pointer to our struct and not just a copy of our struct every time we hit this endpoint. And I never really did a second API call, otherwise I would have realized in the previous demo. So if you want to make sure that this works as intended, make sure you change it into a pointer. And I will also have it updated in GitHub. We are at the HTTP login package. This is our starting situation. And we're going to build HTTP login tests. So we are going to add tests to our Golang code. Tests can make sure that we know that our code is correct. Tests are a bit difficult, a little bit more difficult to write when we are using API calls. You are connecting to a server, so we will have to kind of intercept those connections and make sure that we populate the correct variables with information that we would get if you would make a real connection to test our functions. So let's start in the get call. We have the do request that makes an HTTP request and then has some logic in it that we preferably would like to test. So how do you make a test in Golang? We're going to make a new file, get underscore test.go. And then here you can already choose whether you're going to stay in the same package or whether you're going to create a new package API underscore test to make your tests as if you are outside the package. Which one you pick is going to influence your exported variables. So if you want to use unexported variables, we typically going to use the same package. Get go has the do get request function. So we're going to write a new function, test do get request. And the parameter is going to be T. We're going to be able to use a T parameter. It's of type testing T. So there is a testing framework, a testing package in Golang. So we're going to import testing and this is going to help us write tests. If you're going to incur an error, instead of returning FMT error F or something like that, we're going to do the T error F and this will throw an error. If you then want to stop, we can then return to go outside the function or use any of the other T functions. So there's a fail or fail now. There's also a cleanup. If you need to do a cleanup, there's a fatal and a fatal F. So this testing is again very bare bone, but it's enough to write the tests that we want. If you are used to write tests in other languages, then you will probably miss the assertion functions, but there are other packages that you can use for assertion. Assertion is just comparing variables, which you can do manually as well. So we are going to only use the testing package. How do we test it? Well, best way to do it is we are going to do, we're going to call this function. And then when we call this function with a specific URL, we are going to test whether the response is equal to what we like. So let's try that. Do get request, but to be able to do the get request, we need the API struct. So Let's just apply a dummy URL. It can be anything because we are not really going to call any endpoint. But this is going to be API instance do get request. So we need to define this API instance. And this API instance is going to be of type API. So this is what I was talking about. You either can use the new of the init function, the new, which 
gives us this API interface, which allows us to do the GET request. But then we will not be able to set the clients. We only allow to set the options. So either we create a second new function, which allows us also to set this client, or we just initiate directly this struct and we pass options in the client that we want, which I'm going to do now. Options is options and client is our client. But if I now use HTTP client, what's going to happen is the do get request will actually make a real request to localhost. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to create a fake client so that we can intercept these requests, these get requests and return our own response so that we can still check the logic of our program without the need for a server. So how do we do that? Client is of type HTTP client. Client is of type HTTP client, like here, but we are only using the get function. So if you have a look at the get function, let me just make sure I have get and init open. So the get function of the client, a client get is HP client. And then we have the get function. So let's create an interface type client interface, which is of type interface. And this client interface is going to implement the get function. So now we can say the API is not of type HTTP client. The client in the API is of type client interface. Now we still get an error here. Cannot use HP client literal as client interface value in struct literal. HP client does not implement the client interface method get has a pointer receiver. So HP client has this struct and let's see how I, if I go to this get function, well, it's already of client interface. Okay. Let me just undo this for one second, just to show you why we are getting this error. If I go to the definition, you see the client is a pointer because it is a pointer we will need to make sure that we also initiate our client as a pointer because it is defined as function pointer to client and not just client. So let's undo this again. We have client interface, but we get an error here now. HTTP client does not implement the get function as a pointer receiver. So let's just make a reference to this. And this actually works because now it's a reference to client and it will hit the correct function in this struct. So now we have implement get the client interface. And now this client is of client interface. And what we can do now is instead of passing an HTTP client, we can pass our own client. So let's make our own client type mock client is a struct and we have a function within this mock client of client interface. So this one mock client it has a get function and now we can re reply something. We can reply a response and the easiest is going to be that I can within my function, reply any custom response. So I'm going to say within the struct response output is of HTTP response. And then when I hit this get function, I'm going to return this response output and no error. So then instead of HP client, I can then pass this mock client. So here, you can also use a pointer if you want. So here you can use a pointer or no pointer. If you're using a pointer here, then you need to reference this variable like this. If you don't use a pointer, then it's like this. Mock client. And then in mock client, you can pass this response output. And then this response output will then be returned if do get request hits the get endpoint of the client. Response output is of type HP response. 
and now we can reply a response. What is in the response? The status code, the reply status code to 200, and a body. What body would we reply if we do the do get request? Let's take the same body that we would reply in the real world situation. So that if we do here the get, we then also have the same JSON that we would get. And then we would check on the status code. We should check, we would check on whether it's valid. We would unmarshal it, first the page and then the words. So let's create our own JSON so that we have exactly the same JSON as our server would return so that we can run our test and the test will then go over all this code. To do this, we need another struct because we need one with the page and the words together. Because either we send the page as a JSON or either we send the input and the words as a JSON, but we actually want to send page input and words. So I'm just going to make a new type words page struct and instead of redefining everything i'm just going to say this first part of this struct is going to be page and the second part of this struct is going to be words I'm going to save this and then i can have here this is going to be the output of my get requests words is words page the page is going to be of variable page and it's going to be words and then we're going to have words and it is of type words and then we have an input our input is abc and our words is a string a and b so we can choose we just need to make sure that we then check at the end whether this was correctly unmarshaled then in this function in this do get request function so now we have this in a struct but we need to be able to pass the response and response has a body and what is the body expecting an io read closer so this is going to be bytes and this is going to be golang struct so we still need to convert it to json let's do that first words binds error json marshall will this works if there's an error we're gonna return marshall error so now we have the words bytes and we can reply this but body is expecting a read closer the response body is streamed on demand and then we have this read closer so it's not a reader it's a read closer so we need another function to be able to convert from an IO reader to a read closer. And to find it, you can have a look at how these libraries are written, or you can write this questioning in a search engine to get some clues. And that's how I do it typically. I type these things in Google and then I find some answers on how to return a read closer. So in case here to return a read closer, you need to use the IO knob closer package. Knob close returns a read closer with a no op close method wrapping to provide it reader. So once we have an IO reader, then we can wrap this in a knob closer. And when the stream needs to be closed, it will just close it and there's no code that's going to be executed. And then we need the reader bytes new reader words bytes. Now we're just going to have this JSON as a body that works and then we can do the do get request response error what if there's an error then we can say do get request error and then the response should be of type response if response is nil we just need to check that otherwise if we have no response, then we just need to stop. So we're going to do fatal F. So fatal F equivalent to lock F followed by fail now, because if it's nil, we don't want to execute anything anymore. We're going to say response is error is empty. If it is not empty, 
then we can check the response. If response get response is, and now we want to check if it's not equal to what we expect, we need to throw an error. What is it going to be? So do requests. Let's have a look how our code is written. If we got a word, then we reply the words and the words implement a get response and we just print it. It's a join. So we can say if response is you can just copy this code. Response get response is not equal to the strings. We're going to join this string. We can also make a variable of that. So you can either use a function or just say a comma b. It kind of depends how you like it most. Then we're gonna save it's not the same. Then we're gonna return error. Expected unexpected output. Expected response. And then we're gonna say, okay, the response was this. Not sure if this will already work, but let's test. Let's first run the test, and if this works, let's run the debugging. Okay, we our test passed. That's good news. Let's now run debugging just to be sure. So I'm going to put this breakpoint here. Debug test. Let's go in this function. Do request. We have request URL. So request URL is not really used. And then our client it should be the mock client. So this is the mock client. And then it hits our mock client function. And then we're going to send the output. So this is our output here of a reader and here are our bytes. And then we're going to close it at the end. So that's why we need this read closer because we also need to be able to close it. We're going to read everything from the body. So now we have the body page words input ABC words you see. So this is what we returned. And now we can run this function with our test data. It's going to test whether it's a page, whether it's a word, and then it should return words. And then the word has this get response. And the get response should then be equal to our join string. And this is how we build a simple test function for an API call. Now that we wrote a test for our do request, we also want to write a test for a round trip because our round trip also has some logic in it. The do login request is going to do a post request and we also need to test that. So let's create another file. Transport test.go. And here we will then write our test round trip. And here it's the same. What do we want to do? We want to test this function. So we need first to initialize this myJLT transport. MyJLT transport. And then myJLT transport round trip. Round trip accepts a request. So we want to initialize request as well. So type HP request. And what does it return? A response and an error. If the error is not nil, fatal round trip error. And then the explanation. Res, we're gonna test on res. Let's just make one simple test if res is a HTTP response. So if res status code is not 200, we're going to say that we have an error status code is not 200, got, and then the status code. 
but it will be mainly here that we want to make sure that our round trip doesn't turn, return error. So what happens if you already test this? What would happen is we would go to this round trip function, to this round trip function, and then actually nothing will happen. We will not execute this because we don't have a password set yet. And then we're going to return M transport round trip. So we're just going to fail because we don't have a round trip set. So we have invalid memory address at this point because we didn't set M transport. M transport is nil, and then we are trying to invoke round trip on nil, which is not going to work. So we need to define it transport. But what would we define as our transport? Default transport is of type round tripper. So we're just going to do the actual request. So this is what we don't want. So we can also write a mock round tripper just in the same way that we wrote our mock client. So type mock round tripper to struct. And then we're going to implement the same function here round trip request. And then this default round trip will then be our mock function. And again, we're going to return a specific response round tripper output of type HTTP response. And we're going to return it here. And no error. And then here we can say we're going to use our mock round tripper. And our round tripper output will then be an HTTP response. And let's just only reply the states code 200 because that's what we're checking here for. Let's try to run this again. And our test succeeded. But what did we really execute now? Round trip, no token is set. We don't add a header, so then we just return our mock function. But we really want to test this code, so we will need to add a token. And then when we do the login request, we are passing HP client again, which we don't want. So let's change this as well into an HP client here. Just like we did earlier, HP client, HP. Now we have a client interface. So if we go here, we have a client interface that we can use. And then we'll be able to pass our still our client. But we want to pass our client in the init and not here. So HP is of HP client interface. And then we are going to pass this client HP client. And then here we'll have to initialize this. So in the MyJBLT transport, we'll have the HP client, which is of HP client, which is a new one. It's a different one than this because we don't want to, when we do, when we do the post, we don't want to inject the header. This needs to be a reference. So this is all good. This doesn't work yet because the do login request has an HP client. And this we also need to change into our interface. But here we are using the post. So I just copy paste this first. Client is of client interface, but the post doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't the post work anymore? Because our client interface only implements get. So I just add post here. And then we have post that works. So these signatures in the interface always need to match. And then we can always pass our HP client, but then in the test, we'll also be able to pass our, our own HTTP client. So that will be here next to the transport. We have HP client and let's just pass our mock client. We can make another mock client, but let's just reuse the same one that we have for now, just to keep it simple. We could actually create a mock client for every file, for every test file. 
So this mock client doesn't implement the post method. So let's implement the post method here. Funk, we wrote a get method, but not a post method. Let's use the same strategy here. Response output, post response output. And let's reply the post response output. And this should be get response output. And here we get response output. So this we can copy paste. And we're gonna make it post request output. Post request output. So what happens if you do a post? We are going to reply the token. The token. So it will be of login response. Is there anything that we can copy paste? Login response. Login response. And then we're going to have a token. Token is going to be ABC. And we just need to marshal this. Login response bytes error. JSON Marshall login response. If there's an error, Marshall error. And then here, IO closer reader login response bind. So this is if you do a post request, this is what's going to be replied a token. Is this going to work? Let's see. Okay, this works. And I assume that we went into our into the if. No, we didn't go into the if because I didn't supply a password. Password XYZ. Let's execute it again. Oh, and now we get an error. M token, no. Panic assignment to entry in nil map. So we have the header, which is a map, but it's nil. That happens sometimes because we just initialized a new HP request, but there's nothing in it. Let's try to define this header, which is a new map. So if a map is nil, we cannot assign anything to the map. So we need to initialize the header. The header is a make HP header, and HP header is a map of a string and a string. So if you use the make keyword, it's gonna make this type, this header type, and then we can use this map. Let's try this again. Okay, it works. Let's debug this. Let's go in it. Token is empty. Password is not empty. Do login request. Token is ABC. Okay, so that worked. Now we add the header and then the round trip is finished. No error here. States code 200. There's just one thing that bothers me is that we're not really checking whether we have the header. How would we check for that? If we are doing this other round trip in transport, here we're doing this round trip, we should have this header. So we can test for that and we can test for that in our mock round tripper. If rec header, because we have the request here that is being passed and the request, we, if the token is not, was not empty, then we added a header with bear and then token. So if the header, the authorization header is not equals to bear one, was it one, two, three, ABC, then we can return error, return nil, and the error is going to be wrong, wrong authorization header. And we can output the authorization header as well. Save this. It's going to be error F. Save this. Let's put a breaking point. Let's continue. And 
our authorization is equals to bare ABC, otherwise we would have gotten, gotten the error. That seems to work. What actually happens if we check for ABC Z? Run test. Okay, wrong authorization header. So this actually works. So this is the nice thing about these tests that we can write our tests in a way that we are using this mock round tripper and that we still have checks in this fake function to make sure that we are passing the correct data when we need to do the default round trip. So this is it. If we do now run package test, for example, then it will run the test on our full package and we now already have 60% of our statements covered. You see, so everything in green is already covered. And so now you could actually write more tests to come close to 100. 100% is not always possible and I wouldn't really aim for 100%. Somewhere between 80 and 100% is definitely fine. In this lecture, I'm going to give you a little bit more information about pointers. I have used pointers quite a lot in the previous demos, but I didn't really explain in detail what they mean. Because in Go also, you can go quite away without really having to understand the intricacies, but then at some point it will bite you and you will spend quite some time debugging your code, figuring out why a certain variable doesn't want to update. And when you hit a problem like that, it most likely has to do because of pointers. So I'm going to give you a few examples here to show you how pointers work. Let's start by declaring a simple type. It can be a string, an int, a float. I'm going to call it a. a is a string. And then when we pass a string to a test pointer function, then this will be passed as a value. So it's a copy of the string. What does that mean, a copy of the string? So we have function test pointer, a string. When we access a here in this test pointer function, it's going to be a copy of a, of the variable a. So if I say a equals another string, and I output right here in my main function, then what will I see? String. So I have string. I change it in the function test pointer to another string, but because a is a copy, it didn't change. So when you pass a variable to a function, it will always be passed as a copy. And if you make a change within the function, it will not change. It just, the copy will change. We will go outside the function. And then you are using again the variable a that you declared in your main function, which didn't change. If you want it to change, you can just say, I'm going to pass as a pointer my variable a. And then you also have to use the ampersand sign here to show that you are sending the address of a and not just the variable a. And then here, if you want to change a, you also need to put a star because now it's a pointer. What if I execute it now? And now I get another string. So what is this pointer a? We are outputting here just a, which is the string. But what if you would put an ampersand here so that we are outputting the reference? We just will change the s in a v. Then it shows us an address. So basically, instead of passing the string, we are here passing an address. And then when we change the value of that string at that address, then we can actually make changes to this string. In general, when you are passing something to a function, if you don't need to change it, you can just send it as a copy. So not as a pointer, just like this. Only when it makes sense is if you have variables with a lot of contents in it, like a big file or something like that, and you're not using the streaming, the buffers that we are using, then you could send it as a pointer. But in general, for small strings like that, the best way is to avoid pointers and just send it as a copy if you don't need to change it. There are then some special cases. Let's say our a is a slice. So this is how we can declare a slice. We say this is a string, and in this string slice we have one element, 
call string. Then we just need to accept a slice here. And the first element is another string. So we are just passing all changes in V. So we see the output of a slice. So we have A is now a string slice. We pass it just without a pointer. And then we're going to change it. And what do we expect now? It actually changed. And this is because slices and maps and also channels and channels is something that we haven't explained yet are actually behaving as if you send them as a pointer. So if you want to change elements within this slice, that works without having to pass them as a pointer. But what happens if you want to append it? And that's an interesting case. Let's say we append another string to this string slice that has been passed. And now we get back the original string. So the append didn't work. We could actually change the first element, change element. We could change it, but we cannot append. And that is because if we append, we assign a new slice to A, which will not work in the function. If you want to do things like that, you will have to either return a string and then say A equals test pointer A and then return A and then it works or and or you pass it as a pointer. So you can also pass it as a pointer. And then we just need to change the notation again. Save it. And then we have string and then another string. So this also works. But in general, if you have to create another slice anyways, you could as well just return it. That's what I typically do. So this is the same with a map. So if you make a map, so if you do make map string string, and you have tests is the value. So let's try that out. Map string string a test is new value let's output it test new value that works let's try to add another value and because maps are different than slices you can actually assign another key and that will work within the function so here you don't need to work with a map pointer so you see that depending on the type that you use, the behavior of copy by value and copy by reference, whereas copy by reference is just passing it as a pointer, is actually different depending on the type. So in general, what I would recommend is to definitely write tests if you are unsure how you are passing it, just to make sure that you are actually changing the value of something that you have passed, whether it also really changed in the function that you are calling it. And like our main function, you can output it or you can write tests, but you have to make sure that the value actually changed. It can be a bit tricky, but you quickly get used to it. Let's talk about differences between arrays and slices. The biggest difference between arrays and slices is that arrays have a fixed length whereas slices are dynamic. Let's have a look how you declare an array versus a slice. In an array, we would declare it as var buffer, and then we would specify the size, seven elements in this case, and then the type, byte. So this array can only carry seven elements. If you try to assign something to the eighth element, then you will get an error. A slice, on the other hand, doesn't specify the length because it is dynamic. So if you declare var buffer, 
with the byte type and you don't specify the length, then it is a slice. And then it will dynamically allocate the size that it needs. Still, arrays are important because arrays are the building block of slices. And let me show you that with a simple example. Here we have an array, var array one, length seven, of type integer. In this array one, we are immediately going to put an array integer of length seven with the values seven, three, six, zero, four, nine, and 10. So now we'll have this array of length seven and capacity seven. So an array always has the same length and a capacity because we specify it has seven elements in it, so it can only hold seven elements. These seven elements are being held in memory and contain the values 7360419. So this is an array. We can change these elements in this array, but we cannot expand it. If you want to expand it, we just have to create a new array and copy the data over. Because that would be quite cumbersome as a developer to deal with, we have slices. And slices, like I said earlier, you don't have to specify the length. Let's say we have var array2, which is of type integer. Here you can see that we don't specify a size with our type. So we have a slice. In this specific case, if we then have a look what is after the equal sign, we are assigning to this new array2 a part of array1. So we're using these square brackets here to specify a range. We are starting from element one, which is the lower bound, to element three, which is the upper bound. So the lower bound, element one, is three, then the second number is six, and that is it, because the upper bound is three, but is excluding the number of the upper bound. So the third element here is zero, which is not included. So then we get a new slice, based on our first array with just three and six. So we basically took the number three and six from the first array, and now this is array two. But because this is a slice, this slice is actually referring still to this array one. We didn't create a copy. This slice is a reference to our array one. And that is why the capacity of our slice is six. The length of our slice is two and the capacity is six. This is because the underlying array has this capacity. So six is seven minus one. The original capacity of this array was seven elements, but now this is only a slice and this slice has capacity six. So using this slice length of two, we cannot increase the capacity to the left side where seven is, we only can increase it to the right side. If we would print this slice, it would still give us three and six, but there is additional capacity available in this slice. So a slice has three elements of information that Golang is internally keeping for this slice. The length, it's a length of two, the capacity, it's capacity of six, and it also refers to the element zero, what is the first element that I need to start at? And this element is array one and the first element. The first element is three. So we start counting from zero. Element zero is seven and element one is three. So this is our element zero of our slice. So to know internally within Go what the elements are within our slice, we need to know this element zero, which is three, length of two, so we have three and six. Capacity is six, we actually have free capacity within this slice because we are referring to this underlying array. This is an example where we refer to another array, but we could as well initialize a new slice as well. If we initialize a new slice, then the underlying array will be empty. It will have a certain length and capacity. And if we add elements and there is more capacity available, then the underlying array can be reused we can just increase the length until we hit the capacity. If we don't have enough capacity, we have to allocate a new array 
copy over the elements. And that is exactly what the append function does. So let's have a look with some code examples how this really works. So here I have my example, the same array that I was using in the previous lecture. This is array one with a length of seven and it has seven elements in it. So let's print this first to start with. How do we print it? Can just run it and have fmt print line print the array. So we just get the output of this array, but what is the length and what is the capacity? So let's do another print f. And then we can use len array one and cap for capacity array one. Save this. So this is the output and the length and the capacity is seven. So this is the same as in our previous lecture. Now let's declare array two, which is a slice of integer. And this is equal to array one from one to three. And let's now copy this print ln and print f change array one in array two. Save this. And let's have a look now what is the output. Array one capacity and length is the same. And this is our slice three and six length two, but capacity six. So what does that even mean? Our capacity is six. It means that we could, if you wanted, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but if you wanted, we could increase our length because we have more capacity. So I'll do that. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to do it. It is just to show how slices work in Go. So if I say array two is array two from zero to the length of array one, but I want to increase it with two, then I can do this plus two. So the length is two and now length is going to be four. If I do plus two, I'm going to save it, go run again. Actually, I want, what I wanted is I want to increase from length two to length four. So let me just save this. So you see, if you increase it with too much, then you already get an error. So if I increase it with two, then I see those two elements here, because now I have a length of four. So instead of length two, where I only saw three and six of this slice, I now also see the zero and four, because zero and four are here. And you see that is because the array is still the underlying array. So what would happen if you would loop this slice? So for k range array two, array two k, which is every element in that we are going to loop, plus one, what would happen then? And that's an interesting one because, because it will increase the elements in the slice, but what's gonna to happen to our array one so if you print also array one then you can see array one also changed because the underlying array of this slice is still array one so seven we don't use three from here became four six became seven zero became one four became five and nine and 10 stay the same because we only have those four elements in our slice. So you see, because we are still using this array one as our underlying array of our slice, if we change elements in our slice, it actually also changes in the array. This proves that a slice refers to an array and doesn't really make a copy of an array. So what if we would like to initialize a slice. Can we determine the capacity? So let's 
start with array tree. Array tree is another slice. What is the length and capacity of our slice? So it's empty. It's an empty slice and the length and capacity is zero. What if we initialize three elements? We initialize three elements, one, two, three. Our length is three and our capacity is three. So if you want to add another element to our slice, we would then use the append function. And then we would have to say array3 is append array3 and let's append4. And you see that append will actually create a new slice and assign this to array3. So one, two, three was our slice of capacity three and length three of length three and capacity three. And now we add four and now you can see we have length four, but because we did the append, append is also making sure that we have some extra capacity. So if we have to add another element, element five, we see that our length increased, but our capacity did increase. So append, if you have a look at documentation, if the slice has sufficient capacity, the destination will be resliced to accommodate the new elements. If it does not, a new underlying array will be allocated. So depending on the fact that we have enough capacity within this underlying array, it will reallocate an array or not. Append then returns the updated slice is therefore necessary to store the result of the append. That's why we have to store this result because the updated slice is what we need to store. The underlying array might be different or might not be different. It's only going to be different if there's no capacity. So how do we create an array with our own capacity, with our own length? We can use make for that. So array four, can be make int and then the size. So in three, we can then again output it, clear this, run this again. So now we have array four and array four is zero, zero, zero. Length three, capacity three. But let's say that we want capacity nine, we can actually add another argument here. So the slice, size specifies the length and the capacity of the slice is equal to its length. A second integer argument may be provided to specify a different capacity, not smaller than the length, and it allocates an underlying array of this size. So we can say size three, capacity nine, size three, capacity nine. And then when we do an append, it doesn't have to reallocate a new array as long as we stay within this capacity nine. So this gives you a good overview of the differences between arrays and slices. In general, we're not going to have a lot of exposure to arrays, but more to slices. Because as a developer, you just going to use Go in a way that you don't want to have to deal with the static size of an array. You're just going to use slices and when it needs more capacity, then the underlying array will then be updated. So to fully understand this, I would recommend you to try this out yourself and change the length and capacity a bit to see yourself how this works. In this and in the next few lectures, I want to talk about types in Go. I am in the types demo 
directory and I'm going to create a few small programs to explain you a bit more about types in Go. So let's start with the type switch. It's a switch statement that we can use to determine what type a variable has. So here we have our main.go with an empty main function and I'm going to write a new function. The function is going to be called discover type and I'm going to have a variable t that I don't know the type of. And if I want to accept any type in a go function, I can use the any keyword. And the any keyword is actually quite new. It is a replacement for interface. So in previous Go versions, you could use interface. And you can still use interface, but now it's not encouraged anymore. You should use any. So interface accepts anything, but that has been replaced by the any keyword. Any is an alias for interface and is equivalent to interface in always. So once you accept the any variable, you don't know whether it's an integer or a float or a string, but you can test for that. And depending on what type you discover, you could take certain actions in your function. So to do that, we can use the type switch and we can use T, which is a variable, and then we can use the keyword type and then we are going to compare the different types in our discovered type function. So we can say, if it is a string, then we say string font, and the string is then T. And then now I'm going to save this, and let's pass a string, var T1 is a string, this is a string, and then I'm going to discover the type of T1 and I'm going to run this type switch main.go string found this is a string. If I want to use this variable and I want to say T2 equals T plus and then three dots, this will not work. Invalid operation T mismatch types any and string. So you can not concatenate a string to something that you don't know that is a string. You can still use printf with it because printf accepts any and will then determine itself what it is. So if you say string found s, then printf knows that it's a string that can output something. Printf will try to test itself to see how it can output that variable. So you can pass an any variable to printf, but you cannot use this variable of type any in any operation where you would need to know whether it's a string or not. So you can either change the type of t, so you can say t string, because now we know it's a string, is a string, and then we can output it. So this should work. This is a string, but you can also say value equals t type and then the value will be of the type that it recognized. So if we have k string, then v will be also a string. So if you check here, v is now a string and then we can use v, v as the variable where we want to concatenate something. So then this is a typical notation that you would use T type is what you want to investigate, what is the type of T, but you also want to use the value. So what if we use a pointer string, then we can say pointer string found, and what will happen here? S has the wrong argument, so we cannot really output a string based just on the pointer because the pointer is a reference. So let's see what happens. 
if we pass a pointer string. So that means that if you pass a pointer string, it's a different type. And we need to have a case for the different type. So now T2 is a string pointer and we are passing a reference to T1. Pointer string found and then we get a reference to the pointer. So what if you would use S? Pointer string found, but we cannot really output it because it's not a string. If you want to output the actual string, we would have to put a star before the V to get the actual value and not the reference. So if I do go run now, then this is a string and I get the correct output. What if I have an int, an integer? Integer is one, two, three. And I didn't specify the case. So pointer string found, but the second time nothing was outputted because we don't have a case int. We can make a catch all. We can say default. Default is fmt printf type not found. Type not found. Just going to add this enter. Type not found. But what type is not found? And if you want to display the type, just in case that if we get an error, we would like to know the type, then there is a reflect package in Go that we can use. So we can say type not found and then reflect type of and then the T, which is of any. So you see it takes any and then it returns a reflect type. Pointer string found, that was the first discovered type and the second one type not found int. So with reflect, with this reflect package and the type of function, we can then know what the type is. So case int fmt printf, we have an integer. We have an integer. What if we passed this cover type nil? So if we use any, or we use a pointer, we can also pass nil. Nil just means that there's nothing in it, it's a special type. So we should also be able to figure out that type not found, nil. Type of returns the reflection type that represents the dynamic type of i. If i is nil, type of returns nil. So we can say, my type is reflect. If my type is nil, then we say nil type is type is nil. And otherwise, we can say type not found my type. And then we should get a nicer output type is nil. If there's a function that returns this any keyword, then you can use this type switch to figure out what the type is of a variable. And depending on that, you can take certain actions. This was used quite a lot. And then since Go 1.18, Go came out with generics. And generics I will explain in the next lecture. It is a mechanism to accept multiple types within a function. So instead of saying I accept any type and I will then start checking for any possible type, you can also say I'm only going to accept integers and floats, for example. So integers are numbers and floats can be decimal numbers. So you accept two types and then still within your function, you can work with that type, which makes it a lot easier to write code where you don't always know the variable. 
This is one way of doing it. And in the next lecture, I will show you how to do it with generics. I will now show you how to use generics. So instead of accepting any type, we are now going to accept concrete types. So specifically an integer and a float, for example. So I'm going to close this and then I'm going to go to the generics main.go and I'm going to write a plus one function. So we have an integer, t1 integer is one, two, three, and I'm going to do a plus one. So how would I normally write this? Plus one, t is an integer and I return an integer and I return t plus one. And then I can output plus one is a decimal of plus one t one. So if I now execute this, I will get one, two, four, one, two, four. So I do plus one and I only accept an integer. So if I have another type, a float, so a float can be a decimal number, one to 3.12, this is T2, and you have pass the float, then it will say, cannot use a variable of type float as int value. So I would have to change the value of the float into an integer if I would want to make this work. And let's just change this in V to let printf decide how it wants to output it. 124, 124. You see, so we lost the precision here because we first had to change this type to an integer, which makes it then lose the decimal number and then it goes to plus one, then it is also one, two, four instead of one, two, four plus 12. And it's not because we have a decimal here, that's why it changes to a variable. Even if we would output a float, then it should still have shown it. So let's say that I want to accept floats. Before 1.18, I could do a plus one float. And then I could say float 64 here, float 64 here. And then I would be able to do a plus one float. That I don't need to convert this anymore. And then if I do go run, I get 124.12. But with the introduction of generics, Go makes it easier to write just one plus one function that can serve both floats and integers. We just cannot use the keyword int anymore. We need to make our own type. So it's gonna be V and then with square brackets before the curly brackets, we can then define what V is going to be. What are we going to accept for V? V can be an integer or it can be a float 64. Or it can be also an int 64 or a float 32. So then we accept the 32 and 64 bit variants. So int is also an int 32, but it's not the same as int 32. So we could also add int 32. And then we have all, all the int 32 and int 64 variations. So if you then now do plus one of this float, we will get a float back. So we have one, two, four, one, two, four point twelve. And let's also output the type because that can be interesting. The type, just like we did in the previous lecture, we can do a reflect type of and we can execute the same function again it doesn't really matter and here we do it of t2 save this and then here we see that the plus one here is type int and the plus one here is float 64 so it's not really a dynamic type that suddenly we'll be able to do whatever here, whether it's an int or a float, 
Go is still going to discover the type and then only that type will be used. And to make this more clear, let me show you a few things. So now we are doing plus one because t, which is v, can be an integer float. So if we have a float, we can actually do a plus one. So we could do t2 plus one, and that is t3. But could we do t1, which is an integer, plus 1.05? No, because now we get an error. This 1.05 is a float. We could say it's just float64, for example. And we then have an invalid operation. Mismatch types int and float64. Even if it's going to be a float32, it's not going to work. We always have mismatch type int and float32. So whereas you can do a plus one on a float, because that's possible, 123.12 plus one is easy to do. But on an integer where we don't have the decimal precision, you cannot add 0 0.05 to it. You can add one. You can add one if you want, but not a decimal type. So how would it then work within our function? Because now we can have in our function plus one, we can have an integer or a float. So if we would do plus 1.5, well, that actually doesn't work. Cannot convert one and a half, which is an untyped float to V. So there's no way the compiler can add this together. There are certain limitations still that you have to take into account that you can accept multiple types but that doesn't mean that suddenly those types are compatible. You would still have to write code to handle with different types if you are using operations that are compatible with one type and not the other type. Also, if you would do a sum, so let's put that back in place, sum, and we have t1 and t2, which is of type v, and we need to specify this again. And now we return t1 plus t2. Then let's do a sum of that. Sum of t1 and t1. And what is the type going to be? Sum is 246, type is int, t2 and t2, sum of two floats, and the type is a float. But what if we would do the sum of t1 and t2? Well, we will get an error, because if we pass an integer, then the type of v is now an integer, and v here is integer, but then if you want to pass a float, float64 of t2 does not match the inferred type int for v. So now v is an int, and now it will not be able to infer that other type, because our type is already int. So how to solve that? Well, you could say I'm going to pass v1 and v2 separately. And then I will have v1 here and v2 here. But what am I what am I going to return then? Because now I do t1 plus t2. And there's a mismatch type between v1 and v2. Because how do we do t1 plus t2 when v1 and v2 are different types? So this is not something that can be solved automatically. So we would have to solve that for Go because otherwise it cannot compile. So these generics are definitely a powerful tool. You just have to take into account that it's not magically going to solve having different types. So you would still have to take into account the different types. And when you do a sum, for example, this could work if you do a sum of the same types. Or you write code to handle the different types when you have v1 and v2. 
but generics solve the problem of having a lot of functions. One function per type is not necessary anymore now. You can have one function where you accept multiple types and then do your operations within one function. Let's have a look at the different types that an any variable can have while doing JSON parsing. What we did up until now is to create a custom type like type my JSON is a struct and then in the JSON we can have a name, a string and then we say okay this is a name and then we use JSON unmarshal to unmarshal a JSON into this struct. But let's say we don't really have an idea whether there is a field name that we can parse. Then we need to solve that in a different way. And using the functions that we just learned, like the type switch, we can actually try to figure out how our JSON is structured. And we could even anticipate multiple different types of JSON. So let's start with a variable, a variable JSON parsed, and it's of the any type. And I'm going to do a JSON unmarshal of a custom JSON that I don't really know what's going to be in it. And I'm going to do that in to, I'm going to parse it into the JSON parsed. So unmarshal expects binds and then I'm going to put my JSON just right here. So the JSON is going to be starting with the field test and the field test is going to be another object, not a JSON object. And in that JSON object, I'm going to have test two and the test two is going to be an array of integers. If we get an error, then I'm going to exit with log fatal. So what is going to be our type now of our JSON parse? Let's have a look with reflect, mmt print f, and then reflect type of our JSON parsed. Go run JSON parsing may not go, and reflect says that it is a map of a string and an interface. So interface like this is the same as any. So now we have discovered that our first element in our JSON here is actually a map of strings, which makes sense because we could have another test tree. We could have another test tree, something here, which is just a string or something like that. We don't really know what all the fields are. But now that we have this JSON parsed with any, we can actually parse this manually. So let's try to use a switch statement again. Switch of JSON parsed type. And then the value, not sure if you need the value. Let's start with a default. If it's default, then we say not type not found. And we output a type reflect type of. If it is case map string any, then map found. And then we can output it. Map found. It's a map and we have a key test and there's not a map in there. So then we can continue. So then we can continue parsing this because now FMT print F parse it partially for us, but we still have this any here, which is our key. So we can say if our field one is V, which is a map, does the test, which is this one, 
exist within our map. If this test exists, then OK will be true. And then we can use field one to again parse if you want. Switch v2 is field one because it's an any. And we add the type. And we can also add a default again. If the type is not found, then we can say type not found. So map found, and we try to parse the test part, which is this. Then we say type not found, map string another interface. So we have another map, which is a key and a value, and then we're going to have an array. So we can keep on parsing this over and over again. And we can do this in a recursive function where we could actually write a function where we can accept an any parameter, something like parse JSON element is any, and then we return something. And then we could actually call parse JSON again from this function. Once we hit another any type to keep on iterating this function deeper and deeper until we have resolved everything. But I'm not really a big fan of that because that's again, very abstract. If we know roughly what we can expect, like if we know the field names, we can just parse it like this. We can say, okay, we know that there is a test field in there at some point. If we find a test field and it's still of type any, then we're going to parse it further because often you have some idea how the JSON looks like. It just sometimes that, for example, test could be in some cases a map and in some cases an array, and then you want to manually parse this. There's also a way to override these unmarshal functions if you want to write your own parser. But this method of using any is also something that is often used. You could also partially parse your JSON. So for example, if you have a struct and you know that there is a field name, which is a string. In our case, it would be maybe test string, and that is then the JSON field test. But actually, you don't know whether it is a string. You can say it's any, and then you can parse this, just this test. And then you can have test tree is maybe that's what you know is a string. So that's test tree. So then you don't really have to manually parse this part but you would manually parse this part here. So we could try this out. So if you say this is of type my JSON, my JSON, what's gonna happen here? My JSON is going to be test. So test is gonna be any. So now I already know that I'm in test, so I don't need this code anymore. So now I'm looking for test two because this might be dynamic. And test two, what is test two going to be? Type not found, it's an interface, but it's a slice interface. So now we could say if case, it's a slice of something that we don't know, then we could further parse it case any, and then we can say fmt printf, I found a slice, I found a slice any, let's try that out, I found a slice any, because now we are trying to parse this, but what is this actually, is this maybe an integer, I found a slice integer, will this work? No, this not, doesn't work, actually. I need to, again, test the type. So you could then iterate over this slice for key value of range v2, because it's a slice of any. We probably don't need the key, so we can say v2 element. What is this type? Printfs type of v2 element. Do we already know with reflect what it is? Yes, it's a float64. 
Well, it thinks it's a float 64, but it could as well be an integer. We don't really know. So we found three elements and reflect thinks this could be a float because you might also be able to have one dot one to three. But if we know it's an integer, we could still try to convert it as an integer as well. Now I'm actually curious whether if I do a switch of this v2 element, v2 element, if this is going to give me the same. So what is going to be the type here? v2 element value. Well, save this. Okay, it's also saying a float, which makes sense. So we could either do a switch or we could just say if reef like type of is a float 64, then well, we will have to convert it to a string. Then we can manually convert this v2 element to a float. fmt printf float is f. And I hope it doesn't look too chaotic. I'm just trying to custom parse this JSON using different ways of parsing. So you can use a switch if you have multiple cases that you want to check, or you can also just use reflect to a string to check if it's just a float. And then otherwise you can say, I haven't recognized it. Didn't recognize V2 element. And this is a float. So now we see one zero 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 but maybe we don't really want it to be a float. We are sure that is an integer, so we can still convert to an integer if you want it. And then we need to have a present sign D, or you can use V if you want printf to make the decision. And then we have one, two, three, and it's not a float anymore. Now it's an integer because we converted the float into an integer. Now, if, we had 1.05, then this would be actually a problem because now you can see we lose this precision. So we would then actually need the float. You could actually check whether there is precision or if you are sure that it's an integer, you can always just convert it. So what I typically do is if I know my input is always an integer, I will just convert it from a float to an integer. If I am not sure, I would be able to check or I can also just use float64s and maybe figure out later whether we need this precision or not. So you see, if you don't really know exactly what's in a JSON, you can still define a struct or you can just define any and then start parsing it. So this is a nice application of having to use this switch type where you can have a map or where you can have a slice and depending on what type you have you are going to then dig a bit deeper in the json and extract the elements that you actually need so i will commit this code into my github types demo directory so that you can also review it. In this demo, I'm going to talk about asynchronous calls. That means that some of our code will be executed asynchronous. You can think of it as if code is being executed in the background. Let me show you an example and it will become immediately clear. I'm going to do fmt printf1 fmt printf2 and I'm going to have a test function in between them. Test function and I just need to declare the test function and here I say 3. So how will this execute? 
go run go one three two first it will execute one then the test function and then three and then two let's say that we want the test function to execute in the background we can use the go keyword for that the go keyword means that this test function will be executed asynchronous outside this main function so it will just continue with the printf the next printf and this test function will be executed separately this doesn't mean that our program will be executed quicker necessarily it just means that the test function will be executed separately of our main function this will not work unfortunately because we will exit our program even before we print three so we just have one two so let me just apply a small trick here let's sleep for two seconds to give it enough time to execute one two three so one first executes in the background then it immediately hits two and then three so it shows one two three but even then it's not guaranteed that this three will be executed last it just means that this will be executed in the background and then we just continue with the next instruction and then between the function calls we'll give this function a little bit of cpu time to see where we have to execute also functions in that test function so if you have a program and we need to do something separately so we can just continue going on with our program and we want to offload something then we can use this go keyword for example if we want to do some background checking or if we for example want to have a for loop that separately needs to check something then we can write something like this every second we want to check for something while our program is running so here we're just checking something but this time sleep over here is obviously not very nice to have so in go you have a concept called channels we can create a channel let's call it c we can use the make function to create a new channel and we need to give it a type for example let's give it a boolean this channel we can pass as a parameter and then we can use it in our test function so we can say if let's declare a for loop we're going to only execute 10 times well let's make it five that's quicker and after this we are finished so we are going to say on this channel put true and then we exit this test function and then here after we print two we can say are we finished equals c and then are we finished will then be a boolean so if we then send true to this channel here we can wait until we get one boolean on the channel so once we are here are we finished we will just wait until there is something being sent to the channel and only here something will be sent to the channel after we have checked five times and only then we will continue with the program in the main function so let me print are we finished and then the are we finished variable let me just execute it once and then i will show you how it works step by step using debugging to make it completely clear one two checking 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 until we hit five and then we hit the true this line sends to the channel true so now here this variable gets assigned true and we can continue so this is blocking until we get something on the input so that means that you can also make deadlocks if you don't send anything on the channel and just wait for nothing then the program will be deadlocked so let me try to run the debugging to just to see if we can make it more clear start debugging 
So we make our channel, we pass our channel, we print to, are we finished? And now we wait. And now the checking is running because we are waiting here. And this other test function is just running. Are we finished is true. And then we exit our program. So what if we never put this true here? What will happen then? Go run, checking. And then Go realizes that we are waiting here for the are we finished. We are waiting for something in the channel to appear, but there is nothing. So all go routines are asleep. We have a deadlock and we exit. So we still need to have something writing to the channel or we have a deadlock. Booleans are also not the only thing that we can send. We can also send a string or a struct. We just need to make sure that we pass the types correctly. And I can say we are finished as a string. And then we will see that we get we are finished. So you can also use it as a means to communicate data between your functions once you start using the Go keyboard. One advice I would give you is if you can avoid using the Go routine and the channels, I would avoid it because it can make your program pretty messy very quickly. And if you need it, then you need it, obviously. But if you don't need it, if you can do it in another way, then I would not use it because it's much more difficult to debug and you can see that you can get timing issues easily. So I'm not a big user myself of this. Of course, I have it in my programs, but only when strictly necessary. For example, this are we finished where you are waiting for another process to finish can be very handy if you are waiting for a certain state to be true and you just wait somewhere in your program for a certain state to be true. And then once it's true, then you put something on the channel and it can continue. But like I said, it can get pretty messy very quickly. So if you can avoid it by just writing normal Golang code, then I would do that. One example where Go routines are used is if you have an HTTP server and for every HTTP request that comes in, you can start a Go routine because every request is something independent that you want to handle. And then it's a very easy way to abstract your code. So there are definitely very good use cases where you can use it. Just use it with caution. And also remember that it doesn't necessarily make your program faster because you are using Go routines. If you have one CPU assigned and you use 10 goroutines, those 10 goroutines will get CPU time once at a time. So it's not going to make your program quicker necessarily if you just have one CPU core. When you have multiple CPUs, then you have parallelism and this can make your program run faster. The goroutines use concurrency. So you can have 10 goroutines running at the same time. And that is not the same as parallelism. Where parallelism, everything executes at the same time. With the way that we deploy applications nowadays on the cloud, you are often assigned only a single CPU and parallelism is often achieved by running multiple instances of a program rather than having parallelism within one program. So it really depends how your runtime looks like. I would definitely suggest to read about concurrency and parallelism in Go if you need to optimize for multiple CPUs before using concurrency as a way you want to achieve parallelism. In this demo, I'm going to talk about mutual exclusion. So I called it mutex demo. And I'm going to work a little bit with Go routines and show you what can happen when you need to access variables and change them in Go routines. So I'm first going to make a struct type, my type is a struct. And this struct has a counter, which is of int. And then I'm going to create a go routine that's going to pass this struct. So I'm going to call this my type instance is of my type. And I'm going to 
run a few functions and I'm immediately going to declare those functions. So I'm going to say go func and this is going to be my function. And if I want to execute it immediately, then I put these round brackets straight after the function. So now I have an anonymous function. This would be the same as if I would define a separate function, but rather than defining a separate function, I'm just putting it in line in my main function, a separate function. And this, this whole part will be executed asynchronously. I'm going to pass my type here. So in the, in the round brackets, I put my type instance, and then I need to say my type instance is of type my type. And I want to execute five times this go routine. So I want to have five go routines running asynchronously from each other. So I'm going to make a for loop. And I'm going to put this go routine in this for loop. So I'm passing this my type instance. And let's try to increase the counter. And let's also create a channel because if you would just print the counter here, counter decimal, my type instance counter, I would get back zero because the go routines would run, but I don't think they would get a chance of completing before our program completes. As you have seen in the previous lecture, we need a channel to make sure that we wait until our go routines finish. So oh. finished is a new channel of type bool. And I'm going to say, okay, once I increase it, I finished, I finished this go routine. And then I'm just going to iterate another five times and then check whether this true has been put on the channel. So five times it will wait, five times it needs to get the true put on the channel. And then this will output five times true, but I'm not going to use this output. So this output is bool, so I can just remove this. I'm not going to do anything with the output of this channel. I'm just gonna have to wait five times. Five times something will need to have been put on the channel. Go run still zero and why is it zero because the counter is zero the input here will be counter d and then what's the counter the input here will be zero and the output is going to be one but what are we missing We are passing this my type instance not as a pointer. So that means that even though we make changes to the counter, here at the bottom, we don't see those changes. Those changes are only visible within the function where we are using it. So you can either change it here or we can just pass it here as a pointer. So this is one way of doing it, or we can also make this immediately a pointer. So then my type is a pointer. Here, my type is a normal variable, and then we can pass as pointer. So what will happen now? Now we have five, now our counter has five. And here you already immediately see that we are using go routines so that the concurrency is actually not exactly what you would see here. So it's not that every input is gonna be the output of another function. Let me just do input, output, counter so our first input is zero we do plus one our first input is one we do plus one is two our input is two make three our input is three then we make four but then here for example we can already see that when it was executing our go routines this is asynchronously so depending on how much cpu time is being given to a specific function you see that this input counter here is one so this go routine here, this input is still one because this go routine started when the output was one. So you can already see that it's quite unsafe to use this my type instance counter 
because you don't know exactly what the input is going to be because we launch it five times but it's not launched at the same time it is all running in the background by the time we launch our fifth go routine we don't know how many have been already executed so let's change this a little bit and i'm going to look for let me execute 10 times and i'm going to look for 10 times here as well and i'm going to look for the fifth execution i'm going to say font counter equals to five and we don't need we can have this or you can remove it let's run this okay we have found our output five right here so it was four and we did five but will will this always be true we don't know so let me now change this a little bit time sleep and we're going to use the runt but i'm going to use a math runt so this is pseudo random number generation never use runt from math to generate a password because it's only pseudo random number generation use crypto.rand if you need cryptographic random numbers but this is good enough for our demo so between zero and five random multiply this by seconds and then because this is a number i also need to do time duration so now time duration takes an input Time duration is an int64, so we are taking this int here and converting this to int64, which is now compatible with the time duration, so we can multiply it by time seconds. So we're going to sleep between 0 and 5 seconds, and then we're going to see if we can still find number 5. So what happens? input zero one two three four zero five seven and then the output is all ten so this time sleep just mimics some other functions that we could do like a we could do some api calls and we don't really know how long they take so in this go func you can see that the input is not in complete order and the, out and the output is also not going to be in complete order once we do something within this function that can take some random amount of time. It was already visible earlier, but only a little bit, and now it's definitely visible that we don't really know. We cannot really rely on our input and output to exactly know what it is. So if you are doing some checks whether, some, whether a variable is equal to something else, it might have already been changed in another go routine because this go routine runs 10 times so you are not 100 sure whether you always find the number five for example even if you remove this time sleep there is a chance there is a chance that we will miss it somehow so what should we do then if you want to be 100 sure that these two statements the counter where you change a variable and then you still want to check on it then you need to make sure that this amount of code is executed at the same time and this you can achieve with mutual exclusion mutex and there's a package for that we can say mu is of type sync mutex and then we just pass this along and just before we start we can say my type instance mu lock and this lock will put a lock. If the lock is already in use, the calling go routine blocks until the mutex is available. So this mutex might be available or might not be available, but we will wait until it is available and then we will lock it and then nobody else can lock it. And then we just need to unlock it. We need to unlock it once we are finished. And now we are 100% sure that when we execute this code between the lock and the unlock no other go routine is changing this variable so let's try that out and now it will take a 
a lot longer to execute because we always have to wait for the lock. So you can see input counter is zero, then it's one. And now we always will find five. And now it is nicely in order. So if you want to use goroutines and you want to make sure that no other goroutine is making changes or doing something, you can use this lock with this sync mutex package. There is an alternative approach here. If you just want to have one variable, then you can also write a function. So you can have also a function in this my type, and then you need to make sure that you have also a pointer here. You can say increase counter, and then you can also do the lock right here. So you can say m lock and m unlock. And in between you can do you can increase the counter so this is an alternative oh and this is m m u and m u and this is just m counter if you just want to have a lock then you can use increase counter but we are actually doing multiple things here so that's why we put the lock and the unlock between between our lines here but both approaches are possible you can have a function within your struct or or you need to have some logic within your coroutine itself where you need to use lock and unlock so there's two approaches and this is a very common way of programming when you are using goroutines and you're gonna hit some concurrency problems then you want to use this locking mechanism